Hi, it's John Van Gorp, and on behalf of all of Mayor Brown, welcome to our third annual Mortgage Read Summit. It's hard to believe it's been three years already, but yet it's easy to believe that it's been a long year since we last met virtually. I'm certainly hopeful that next year for the fourth annual summit will be in person again as we were for the first one and back to more normal times. I think we're all seeing encouraging signs that that might be possible. What a difference a year makes. I remember sitting in this room a year ago, introducing this conference at a time when there was lots of uncertainty on the horizon. And I follow the mortgage REIT ETF known as MORT pretty closely. And that I think is a real indicator of what a difference a year can make. Uh, it's currently trading at 260% of its low that was about this time last year. So there's been an amazing uh, resurgence of uh, the mortgage REITs who uh, all were suffering to some degree at this time last year. And I think that brings tremendous new opportunities to the mortgage REIT industry, new opportunities for growth, new asset strategies, new capital formation strategies, maybe M&A activity even as REITs start to get into the manufacturing of asset business. We're going to cover all of those points today. I think it's also been a validation of the mortgage REIT model. It allows investors access to exposure to mortgage assets, which is really important, particularly retail investors who are looking for yield. It's an efficient way to finance assets with permanent financing term to maturity. And as we see a lot of the mortgage business come out of the banks, that's really important. But maybe even more important is the place that mortgage REITs serve as an incubator for new strategies and new asset development. We think about some of the mortgage tech and FinTech developments and the assets that are being produced and the REITs providing capital for the evolution and development of that market. And I think that's really exciting. Renewables, which we'll talk about today, bring yet another aspect to the potential for mortgage REITs. So I welcome you. I hope you have a great time this afternoon listening to all the various things we have to say. We've tried to keep our comments very timely, very market oriented, which is our custom here uh, for the summit. So I hope it is as useful as the other ones have been. Just a couple of administrative matters. We have three panels today. For those who are seeking CLE credit, there'll be a code announced during the panel. So you can record that on the forms that should have been sent to you at the email link if you're looking for CLE credit. I'll be back at the end of the summit to wrap up with some remarks, but I'm going to turn it over to Jen Fuller of KBW. Jen has the distinction of being a participant all three years. So if I could virtually award her a gold star for that, I would right now. And uh, Jen, um, I'm going to turn it over to you to take us forward on the first panel. Thanks everybody for your participation. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, very happy to be here for, for three years in a row. Thank you, thank you for having me back. Um, today I'm joined by, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm Jennifer Fuller, Managing Director in the uh, Investment Banking Practice at KBW, and our, I lead our effort in mortgage REITs. Uh, today I've got a couple of colleagues joining me. I've got Victor Sack, who runs uh, KBW's Capital Markets Practice, and Andy Finwick, who's also a managing director in the same practice. And so what we intend to do today, and, and Michelle, I'd ask you to go to uh, sort of flip through the cover and then the table of contents of our deck. Um, it, what we intended to, to do today is give a little bit of an update on broad capital markets, um, everything from uh, what's happening in the overall market to the role of the SPACs over the last year or so. Uh, then we'll dive into mortgage rate financing, what's been done recently and what the trends are. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the valuation drivers that are currently driving valuation in the mortgage REIT sector. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, recent uh, M&A and um, strategic transactions and processes. So um, to start the, the content, uh, I'm going to ask uh, that we turn the, the first page and I'm going to turn it over to Victor and Andy. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, John. Uh, good to Good to be here today. Um, we're going to start at the high level and kind of work our way down through the presentation. You know, obviously the, the past 16 months have been a pretty remarkable time in the equity markets from the initial market sell off to the two phased or, or what we call the K shaped recovery where the growth oriented sectors and companies um, tended to recover very quickly and were trading at or through their pre COVID levels by by kind of early summer. Um, and a lot of the other sectors like energy and travel and frankly, a lot of our sectors at KBW and financial services um, recovered more slowly and, and were uh, to some extent 
you know, there was th this divergence where um, uh, our investor focus shifted to payments, to fintech, to financial software, all the sub verticals that would enable e commerce as the world shifted in that direction all outperformed. Um, and these are the companies where the valuations are also largely based on, on forward earnings, future year earnings, which were not going to be as impacted by, by COVID and the lockdown. Um, so those sectors and companies participated fully in the recovery, but a lot of the more traditional companies with balance sheet exposure or consumer finance exposure were really kept in the penalty box until there was a higher degree of clarity later in the year around vaccines and economic recovery. Um, but at this point, you know, most of the, the, the subsectors we cover at KBW and financials have fully recovered and uh, most of our indices, whether it's the banks, insurance or fintech are trading at or near all time highs. Um, as you can see in the page in the upper left, the, the mortgage REIT sector, um, which did unfortunately have to catalyze some of the sell off at the bottom. Um, clearly, valuations have come a long way back in recovering. Um, the share prices versus pre COVID levels still reflect some of that that hit, but clearly when we go into uh, further in the presentation, Jen's going to have a lot of pages sh showing how the valuations have recovered and frankly, what's driving some of the differentiation between where the various companies are trading. Um, in the lower left of the page, you can see there's clearly money being deployed into financials. Um, the flows into financial focused ETFs, which we use as a barometer for broad flows into all financials um, are running at the highest level since uh, post the 2016 election. Um, and you can see in the lower right hand side of the page that volatility is extremely low in the markets, um, which all of this explains uh, why it's confusing to some of our clients um, that we are telling them that the actual uh, new issue market is pretty choppy. I think if we go to the next page, we can take a look we can take a look at the new issuance trends in the equity markets over the past uh, year. And you can see that in May and June, there was significant issuance. Um, really, a lot of that was pent up demand uh, coming out of uh, the lot earlier stages of the lockdown and COVID. And you had a, a number of companies that were well positioned and were actually going to benefit from the shifts in consumer habits um, issuing into the equity markets. And then you had a number of companies that were in a, a distressed situation also being forced to issue. So we had some very heavy issuance months, but really throughout the year, I would say it normalized, but it normalized at a, a pretty high level. Um, so I would say these are, these are still very high sustained levels of equity issuance. If you think about January, February, and March in the first quarter of this year, uh, the, the amount of new issue equity that's come into the market is, you know, exceeds by, by a factor of two and possibly three what has come into the market, you know, in the first quarter, either last year or any of the past five years. Um, a part of that has been SPACs, which we're going to touch on in, in a few pages. But even if you think about the regular way follow on market, we're running it at almost a 3x pace right now. Um, what we were doing at this point last year and in years before. So the bottom line is there's been a tremendous amount of issuance. Um, there is some fatigue out in the market. Uh, we're hearing from investors that, that deals are you know, going to have to come together slower. They've raised the bar in terms of what they're willing to look at and they're looking for, you know, maybe some sectors that haven't had as much issuance over the past year to kind of right balance their portfolios. Um, and you can see in the bottom of the page that, you know, the mortgage REIT sector, which has always been somewhat cyclical in terms of issuance is still at a pretty low pace of issuance, though it is certainly recovering. And we've certainly seen a couple deals this year and we are starting to see, you know, more investor interest coming back asking, you know, is there a way to deploy capital profitably? And if so, you know, where should we be allocating our equity dollars? Um, one interesting thing that, that came up, if we can go to the next page. Last year, uh, you know, 1 of the more notable developments, um, at least within financial services was that there was a significant increase in the number of small financial services companies banks for the most part at the beginning. Um, that really ramped up and increased their uh, accessing of the debt markets, um, utilizing investment grade ratings from Kroll and Egan Jones. Um, they started to, to ramp up their issuance that attracted more investors who drove the coupons down. We started to see supply demand imbalance that attracted even more issuers. And it kind of turned into a cycle that played out through the year with, you know, consistently lower coupons being printed in deals. 
And in terms of volume, at least in sort of the community and regional bank space, there was probably $10 billion of issuance by these smaller banks last year and the regular run rate in the years prior to that was maybe two to three billion. So it you know, really did see a deepening of the buyer base that's out there looking for these sort of niche yieldy type investments. And we are now definitely starting to see that buyer base uh, spread out and look beyond depositories. So we've seen them looking into some specialty finance companies into BDCs. We have seen issuance uh, out of the mortgage REIT sector and we know other conversations are ongoing. So we do expect this to be a trend that continues um, and to, that we see spread throughout a lot more of the, the KBW sub verticals. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Andy, if you have any comments on this page to add, or you want to take us through the uh, SPAC page. Yeah, why don't, why don't we turn the page to, to the SPAC page on? Uh, okay, great. Thank you. So, with respect to, to SPACs, you know, as, as we think about the emergence of, of this product and, and how they really fit within the, the broader equity capital markets landscape, um, you know, here at KBW, we do believe this product will have uh, a certain degree of permanence, um, you know, with the important caveat that the nature of this product uh, will be an evolving process, um, not only structurally, but uh, on the regulatory uh, side as, as well. Um, you know, as you look at the page, when looking at, at front end IPO issuance levels uh, this year, um, IPO issuance really started off uh, just as uh, it had left off in the prior year with, as you can see, over 300 vehicles coming to market over the first four months of the year. Um, and in spite of the, the recent slowdown, you know, these are, are levels that have really easily surpassed uh, issuance volume that came to market in, in all of 2020. And, and so what, what does this all mean? Um, with, with over 400 public sponsors right now searching for partners and, you know, approximately 120 billion plus uh, of capital and trust, you know, it truly represents a lot of of capital that's in the market right now competing for deals. And so, you know, said simplistically, we, we do think SPACs will continue to be a very important driver of, of mar market dynamics. Um, and, and as we focus on the bottom part of, of the page, uh, in terms of composition, you know, while we do see and continue to see a, a well-balanced uh, sponsor landscape, uh, not only amongst sectors, but among strategies as, as well, Really, many of the themes uh, that that Victor spoke to that that moved the broader markets higher uh, over the past six to eight months have have really been, I guess, have really been amplified um, in the types of new public companies coming to market through SPAC combinations, namely tech, uh, very high growth sectors uh, as being the main beneficiaries. Um, and you know, relevant for for the audience on on the line here today, um, while there have really ha has not been uh, you know a track record of of SPAC issuance or SPAC combination within the mortgage REIT sector, uh, you know we have seen a growing number of combinations uh, announced in you know mortgage and and mortgage related or real estate related markets uh, really primarily through uh, the prop tech sector, as you can see, which has certainly attracted uh, a lot of venture capital dollars over the past you know, 12 to 24 months and, and represents a trend that we do see continuing. And then in addition to, to prop tech, uh, we have also uh, seen a number of what we would characterize as tech enabled platforms coming to market. Uh, seeking to disrupt uh, legacy segments of, of the mortgage market, which which certainly bears watching. Um, you know, the, the last point I think I, I would highlight uh, with respect to, to the SPAC market uh, as it currently stands is I, I think it's important to, to note that there there has been recent underperformance of the asset class uh, given transactions that were struck, uh, you know, in February and March at what have arguably arguably been peak multiples, uh, you know, amidst of what we 
would characterize now as somewhat of a broader rotation to more value oriented sectors. And the performance of these recently announced combinations, I, I do think bears additional watching as it will really have a direct knock on effect on potential combinations being previewed and, and negotiated with the investors as, as we as we sit here today. So with that, Jen, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Let's go to the next page. I'll go through the next couple pages really quickly. So this page shows, and, and from here on out, I, I'm, I look at commercial and residential mortgage rates sort of separately. Um, the, the blue is residential and the, the gray here is uh, commercial. So on the left-hand side of the page, you see that the return of these stocks, um, they are below their pre-pandemic levels uh, at the end of 2019 and, and through uh, sort of to, to shut down. Um, but they have, um, they've recovered nicely, but they're still below those levels and they have significantly outperformed the overall market. Um, the green here is the S and P 500. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that the book value valuations have recovered and the, and the, the, what gets you from the 1st graph to the 2nd graph is really the, the loss of book value, um, particularly through. Uh, realized losses, but you are trading back up to something close to book value, which I think is a much more normalized uh, level, even though it's still a little bit below on a valuation basis, our index price to book. Um, I'm going to go to the next page where we strip out the uh, market valuation and just look at effectively economic return of these stocks, dividends and changes in book value. And you do see that um, on the top, commercial mortgage rates have been flat to, to modestly positive as a, 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 on a median basis for all of them. And on the bottom, uh, residential mortgage rates have not fared as well uh, with sort of negative 15 to 20 percent median uh, economic return. So the and if I look at the the folks that have done well versus not done well, uh, the negative numbers are those that uh, were were in the headlines for uh, forced liquidations, um, you know, running processes, etc. On the residential mortgage rate side, the positive returns were generally folks that had some concentration in agencies, which was the first subsector of assets to get some support and therefore stability and financing. Um, so it, it had a lot to do with with leverage and type of financing. Um, and then it, it, I think the, the throughout 2020, which is what we're showing here, the uh, the amount of losses that these companies were um, chose or were forced to take uh, through sales of assets, I, I think is meaningful as well. Um, and to the extent that they weren't required to take meaningful losses, you, you do see some recovery in the uh, in the book values and, and most of these folks have, have stabilized from a liquidity perspective. I'm going to go to the next page. Um, the 1st wave of, of, um, looks like our logos are a little bit off here, but the 1st wave of financing, uh, although there were, there were a number of sort of more granular financing transactions. We don't show on this page, but the 1st wave of financing after a little bit of a lull where issuers look to determine whether they were coming back to normal and mull over some fairly expensive proposals was the investment of um, a lot of strategic capital in the sector. And so here you, you see a number of very well-known brand name asset managers and other financial firms that invested in mortgage rate issuers who felt who were either having liquidity challenges or felt like they needed additional liquidity uh, to, to sort of buffer against the uh, liquidity related risk during COVID. Uh, most of them came with warrant packages. They all came with non dilutive or sorry, not non dilutive, but sort of uh, debt or preferred securities and, and represented fairly uh, expensive capital. But that was that was what was available uh, sort of in the 2nd quarter of the year. And you see a couple of them afterward. Uh, most were 1 off. Uh, sort of transactions, great Ajax was done with uh, uh, affiliates of the company and the Exantis transaction was done as part of an overall strategic transaction where the manager was changed. Um, and the rest of them, I think really what this represents is that a lot of smart asset managers knew and felt that the, the distress in the market was temporary. Um, and, and wanted to take advantage of the ability to invest in the in the common equity and felt like that was a, a good value even versus the assets, which they were also looking at at the time. Um, I'll go to the next page where we actually look at underwritten capital issuance. 
so here's here's what I, I think how to, how to take this and and the the three respective graphs here is the top is the amount of capital raised, the middle is the percentage of capital raised by type based on the legend at the bottom, and then the third is the number of offerings by type of capital. So what you see in 2019 was that there was a lot of capital raised in the mortgage REIT sector, um, over 9 billion. And that was really focused on uh, follow on offerings as well as perpetual preferred securities uh, where there was a lot of demand. And then as you got into, and same thing in first quarter of 2020, as you got into the remainder of 2020, it was really focused on um, debt transactions and, and fewer of them uh, in, in terms of number, fewer larger transactions. Um, as Victor said, we first saw the sort of uh, unsecured uh, and subordinated debt raising in the bank sector. Then you saw it in the BDC sector that have some natural leverage limitations because of their 40 act status. And then you see, you, you now see it in the mortgage REIT sector and the um, and the, the broader specialty finance sector. Um, these debt transactions have been done in, in a couple of different ways, as, as Victor mentioned, with investment grade ratings, um, but they, they've been both sort of uh, $1,000 par as well as $25 listed uh, bonds that, with it that are generally referred to as baby bonds. And over time, the yields on those, the spread that have gotten lower, the spreads even as treasuries ticked up has, have gotten lower. The most recent baby bond transactions for mortgage rates have been done uh, at, at a, I believe, a 575 coupon for a five year. Um, uh, and uh, those are typically done with uh, that are very no financial covenants, covenant light, um, unsecured senior uh, debt. And then you started to see, although it wasn't available it, it really in, in, in mid 2020, you started to see investor interest come back into the uh, perpetual preferred securities. And, and that's really institutional interest um, more so than it has been in the past. Um, we, and, and those are, are rated perpetual preferred. So we're seeing the market first open up for for uh, unsecured debt, uh, now perpetual preferred. This is after you know the sector had 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 taken a while as as these issuances work through banks and through um, other BDCs and especially finance companies or the mortgage rates. And we still see a lot of demand. We know that there are a lot of issuers and, and probably some on the phone who are looking seriously at these transactions. I think you know you're at a uh, really sort of narrow spread versus where uh, this market has been historically. There's a lot of flexibility, both in preferred capital and covenant light unsecured debt. Um, and so these have, these have been viewed as very attractive securities and we expect to see more of this in uh, 2021. Although the other thing that's happening in 2021 is that issuers are back to market with follow on offerings. Um, and uh, you, you've seen some convertible issuance uh, sort of smattered in here as well, and those tend to be larger transactions. Um, so you see it more on a dollar basis than you do on a on a number of transactions basis. Um, because of this issuance of low cost preferred and debt, you've also seen a number of redemptions of securities in, in capital stacks. And then I think probably most meaningfully, Despite the fact that there has been a record amount of capital issued, particularly to through, through LP funds or private funds to invest in distressed commercial real estate and distressed commercial real estate debt and other opportunistic uh, funds raised at the same time privately, you really haven't seen IPOs in this sector um, yet. Yet. Um, since COVID, there's been one mortgage read IPO really focused on the cannabis sector, which is really a um, a bit of a different investor base, um, but you, um, you you haven't seen uh, folks go public to take advantage of of distress, and and now we are uh, we are particularly we're, we're normalizing again. Um, I'm going to go to um, the next page where and I think this page is actually uh, interesting because historically there have been a number of things. Driving in the, what drives uh, valuation has been different um, over time. Pre COVID, you saw a lot of distinction when it came to uh, size. Uh, you saw a, a companies of issuers, you saw a lot of distinction on strategies. Uh, right now, I think it's pretty clear what's driving stock prices. So the top chart is. Uh, 
but it graphs price to tangible book value of commercial mortgage rates on the y axis versus annualized current dividend divided by tangible book value on the x axis, which is a, a pretty accurate predictor of or, or of, of what the issuers believe their uh, longer term earnings or profitability run rate to be, although not exactly. But you see between these two things for commercial mortgage rates, a really high cor correlation. We have an R squared that suggests that that's over 80% of what determines price to book uh, to price to tangible book value. Um, and the intercept here is around 785. Um, so you see that that's really what right now is driving valuations. Uh, now, th the second thing I would mention is that size is not unsignificant, but it's hard to separate um, correlation from causation. If you look at uh, the commercial mortgage rates with a market cap of over 2 billion, they've got a dividend yield of around, or dividend divided by tangible book value, excuse me, of around 11. Um, 1 to 2 billion market cap has around a, a, a ratio of around 8%. And then under a billion market cap, dividend divided by tangible book is around 6%. So there is a difference, but you do see a, a, a very clear clustering around this trend line uh, for uh, dividend divided by tangible book value. On the bottom of the page, though, the, the residential mortgage rates trade very differently. Um, and I think this is largely a distinction of, um, you know, sort of the impact of uh, mark to market accounting on uh, securities for residential mortgage rates, as well as uh, perceived franchise value in residential mortgage rates versus commercial mortgage rates for most of the issuers. Um, but what you see here is the green line on the bottom chart is a coral is the same correlation as above. For residential mortgage rates, uh, and it's not particularly strong. But then, when you take out the mortgage rates that have the residential mortgage rates that have a market cap of under uh, 500 million, which are the one, which are the green dots here, um, and you look at what remains, that's a pretty that those things are trading at around book value. You can look at that blue line to see that it's almost horizontal at around book value. So, with those companies that have a, a, a market cap of over half a billion, their price to book range, so 25th to 75th percentile is around 98 to 102%. So it's pretty tight. Uh, and the others below 500 million are trading around 85% of, of tangible book. And so I think pretty clearly what this says is that um, the, the residential mortgage rate sector is trading at or around book value, whereas there is a penalty for size. And it's difficult to tell whether um, it, it, exactly why uh, that is, but I, I think it's pretty clear that that, that, is the, um, that that's the case. Um, I will say, you know, outliers here, you have one outlier that's way above the uh, above the line, the, the one that's the highest in terms of price to tangible book. Um, and, and there you have an earnings run rate uh, or estimate this year that's well below above the, the annualized dividend. And you have uh, a company that's really doubled down on infrastructure asset manufacturing um, through some acquisitions. Um, I'm going to go to page 12. Uh, and, and just touch on the M&A activity in the space. I think unlike, I mean, we talked about this a bit last year uh, and there are, you know, there are multiple drivers for M&A in the mortgage rate space. And, and you really see that here. Um, uh, Tremont RMR is, a, is an affiliate transaction. Uh, Redwood Trust made a minority investment in um, uh, a lender, Churchill, you have, um, New Res's acquisition of Caliber, which is really doubling down on uh, infrastructure through acquisition of a mortgage originator. Um, you've got um, Annaly selling their uh, commercial uh, real estate finance business, and which is which is a strategic divestiture um, that has a lot to do with where, uh, as they publicly talk about it, where they'd like to be uh, in terms of uh, asset classes. And then, and where they'd like to deploy their capital, and then you've got ready capital and worth, which is really a um, an effective capital raising transaction. And so, as you look at it, I I don't think that there is a common uh, thread that runs through these transactions on this page. Although I think you could um, say that that for um, uh, for Redwood and New Res, or rather Churchill and Caliber. You do have uh, a, a bit of 
uh, divergence in the residential mortgage REIT space with companies that have um, stayed portfolio investors, QSIP securities, uh, and believe that that's what they want to be over the long term. And companies like New Res and Redwood, which have re who have really leaned into uh, infrastructure uh, and and uh, tried to increase franchise value uh, through the through both originating assets and and uh, putting complementary businesses together. Um, so today, those are are much more uh, infrastructure intensive companies. The last thing I would mention uh, on the following page is that there have been uh, there has been an unusually high level of um, of management contract movement in the space. I'm not sure what other term to use for that uh, as a as a catch all. Um, you saw three internalizations. There was Annalee, Granite Point, and Two Harbors. Uh, Granite Point and Two Harbors were were uh, affiliates under the the same ex external manager, and so you know that those two things are not completely unrelated to one another. Um, Annalee and Two Harbors internalized for um, no consideration to the manager, whereas Granite Point did pay um, a, a cash consideration to the manager. And then you've got uh, Exantis and Hunt. Um, Exantis did a, a strategic. Excuse me, a strategic transaction with Acres Capital Corp, uh, the same one uh, where where um, Oak Tree and Mass Mutual were involved in making uh, a capital investment into the company, and so that was effectively a, a change of external manager from C3 to Acres. And in Hunt's situation, um, Hunt Real Estate Capital was acquired by Oryx USA. And so their change in manager was really to transition to a, a subsidiary of Oryx USA. I think if you were to, to sort of interpret, um, well, what I would view as Annalee Two Harbors and Granite Point together, um, it, what I would say is that the mortgage REIT sector among all REITs uh, has been the most tolerant, investors have been the most tolerant of mortgage REITs in terms of being externally managed. The equity REIT space has not been tolerant at all. You had single family rental IPOs over the last um, eight, nine years where uh, they were initially accepted as externally managed companies and ultimately internalized. Um, it, but shareholders would prefer all things held equal internally managed companies and um, it, they require <laughs> the companies to justify the value of their sponsor's role in the REIT. Uh, and so wh while the events leading up to the internalization of these three companies are different and, and more complicated than that, uh, we do see when we talk to investors about potential new IPOs, as well as um, the existing companies in the mortgage REIT space, that they they have some aversion to external management structure, although they are willing to accept uh, some of the, the the companies who have large asset manager sponsors who uh, have infrastructure that is accretive uh, to the REIT. It's it's very difficult to start from uh, a REIT from a small team, and there are asset managers that have a lot to add in terms of infrastructure and knowledge and deal flow. So you see tolerance for that reason, uh, and then you see a clear preference uh, outside of that for internally managed companies um, that that really can show that their interests are aligned. Um, so that's what's happened in the in, in the mortgage REIT space, or the highlights of what has happened in the mortgage REIT space recently. And um, the, the other the other piece that we're we're not talking about today has really been that there's been a lot of activity, uh, as I think the participants today w well know in the broader mortgage and prop tech sector. Um, and so the the, the uh, attention has really been on operating companies in the uh, origination space, although you know that's rapidly changing, uh, as well as prop tech as we look at you know, the the um, the sector going through the 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 particularly the residential mortgage space going through an evolution as we uh, in residential real estate sector going through an evolution uh, with technology as we look forward. And so while the impacts of that uh, may not be seen immediately on the mortgage REIT sector, there's a lot of attention on that outside of the mortgage REIT sector. 
Um, and you, you see some crossover with things like the, the, the Churchill and the caliber home loans transaction, uh, as well as some of the other things that um, New Res and, and Redwood, for example, are doing. So um, that is, uh, and so to be, de to be determined where, that, where that's going. Uh, but those are our highlights, and I guess I would turn it over at this point um, and, and unless there are uh, any other questions to um, to Andrew and, uh, and and Krista. So I'm going to give an overview of where the Biden administration is likely to move on financial regulatory policy. Uh, there's a lot going on in Washington uh, since uh, the inauguration uh, that will impact the space. I'm going to give the broad overviews and, and, and highlight a, a couple of key areas, and then Krista uh, will follow it up uh, with a uh, focus on the, of the CFPB um, uh, activities. So the, the administration's policy agenda uh, is pretty broad, um, but I think it breaks down into three uh, main buckets, which is uh, addressing climate uh, risk. Uh, climate change is something that has really unified the Democratic Party. Uh, it also brings along a fair number of moderate re Republicans, so it's a, a strong area for policy. Um, but what uh, to begin with, but what makes the Biden administration uh, approach really interesting and unique is that it is a full government approach. One of the earliest EOs that the administration uh, put forth uh, indicated that policy, uh, all federal agencies, not just the traditional uh, environmental agencies like the EPA or Interior, but all federal agencies needed to consider uh, climate risk, not only in their um, the policy in all policies that they adopted, but also in their their own activities and their own carbon footprints. And we've never had such a focus on on climate risk bef uh, before, uh, and this really shows that 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 major shift that the Biden administration is attempting to uh, uh, to effectuate. Uh, that. Uh, it, uh, because of the broad base, that also means financial services. And in fact, financial services regulation is going to be one of the main uh, uh, levers on which the administration seeks to implement uh, a new uh, climate change uh, policies. Uh, at the top of that list is the SEC is likely to um, move forward on a broad range of new disclosures related to ESG topics. Climate will be the focus of that. Uh, we right now don't know the the scope uh, of those new disclosures, but the SEC uh, uh, former acting uh, chair uh, Allison Lee has directed staff to, to uh, begin a process of examining where new disclosures would be needed, and as well uh, instructing uh, enforcement staff to and Corp, Corp Fin to examine where uh, uh, existing disclosures uh, have failed to uh, uh, sufficiently uh, disclose. Uh, climate risk uh, to investors. So it's something at the top of the list of the new chair, Gary Gensler, uh, a, a policy list uh, uh, as he uh, begins to uh, take over at the SEC. He was just recently confirmed uh, to his terms. Um, he will soon, uh, it's expected that he'll soon come out with uh, his priorities and his full agenda. But at the top of that list, it's likely to see disclosures. Um, the other area, uh, Two that we'll see uh, with regard to uh, addressing climate risk is going to be in the terms of uh, banking regulation. Uh, this is a more complex area, but the impact is actually potentially to be greater over the long term as uh, banking regulators look to see how climate uh, change risk can be incorporated in a bank uh, bank's risk frameworks. Um, the data on this is still kind of coming in and being analyzed by uh, uh, the federal banking regulators uh, with the Fed taking the lead role here. It's something that um, we've already seen uh, Fed Governor Leo Branner come out and say uh, and, and give a framework for how the Fed's going to approach this, which is likely to require banks to begin doing scenario analysis to examine how climate uh, change could impact their portfolios and their operations. But not taking the initial the, the, the additional step of actually re uh, requiring changes in capital requirements and liquidity, those things that would really move move um, changes in lending. However, it, it's interesting to note that uh, just last week uh, at uh, President Biden's uh, climate summit, uh, Secretary Yellen uh, gave a major speech, uh, which I think is very significant for the fact that she addressed head-on kind of calls for uh, bank regulators uh, to slow down the pace and collect more data and get uh, better analytics before they move forward 
on addressing climate risk through financial regulation. And she explicitly rejected that and said that uh, this is not the time to move slowly. And in fact, it's time to move boldly. So the administration um, is, 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 is really made this a, a top priority and we're gonna see a lot more on it over the, uh, over the next four years. The next area bucket um, to, to, to be aware of is uh, the administration is very focused on using the financial system to promote inclusion. Uh, this also is part of the ESG, uh, part of the ESG disclosures on having corporations likely disclose uh, the diversity of their, their workforces, but it's also uh, broader. You're likely to see a much more uh, aggressive enforcement of, of, uh, of uh, fair lending laws under the administration, which uh, Krista will talk a little bit more about the CFPB and potential DOJ involvement, CRA enforcement uh, for banks uh, will all be areas that um, get additional scrutiny uh, under, under the administration. Now, one thing to note though, um, uh, it's important to note uh, is that uh, there is a little bit of a delay in how these policies will be implemented. Um, you know, as I noted below, um, we've seen that several of the key positions have been filled uh, with Secretary Yellen, Brian Dees, and Gary Gensler. Um, those positions have been filled, but we still have some of the key uh, financial regulatory positions uh, still open. The control of the currency is the most notable one. Um, that position is still being held by uh, an acting comptroller right now. And then at the end of this year, um, one of the most important positions um, on uh, bank re regulation is uh, the Fed's uh, vice chair for supervision uh, position, which is held right now by Randy Quarles. That uh, uh, position opens up, uh, 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 vice chair Quarles terms ends in October. Um, that position is one to keep a careful eye on. Uh, whoever gets that will play a key role in kind of drive, driving all, all financial regulatory policy uh, for the rest of the Biden administration. And then, of course, uh, Biden will have a decision about uh, what he wants to do about uh, the Fed share as Powell, uh, Powell's terms ends uh, in February of, of next year. So um, because of the delays in the appointments of these process, financial regulatory policy tends to have a lag from, from elections. Um, we're seeing that it, seeing that again here, but I, I wouldn't take the leg to mean that it's something that can be delayed. Uh, paying attention to these policy changes should be delayed uh, 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 until we see uh, new new administration officials actually confirm, because for the most part, uh, the uh, staffs at these agencies are already w uh, working on a lot of these issues in anticipation of the, the change, in, change in leaderships. The other kind of bucket that we'll see here on financial regulation is really a strong oversight um, uh, and stronger involvement by the federal federal government in financial regulation and uh, corporate decision making. Now, uh, one area that I would like to know uh, for this audience is the um, likelihood that the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, is likely to take uh, become more emboldened under Yellen. Uh, Secretary Yellen prior to taking office, office indicated that she wanted to see a much more aggressive FSOC. Um, and then uh, you know what, what that looks like is still to be determined, but it is expected that the FSOC is gonna take a much more uh, uh, closer look uh, at non-bank mortgage companies, um, both in terms of their funding structures, uh, examining particularly for whether there's an asset liability uh, mismatch um, that they believe could cause systemic risk. You're also likely to see um, uh, a continued uh, focus on money market mutual funds, which the SEC has already uh, said that it would undertake to, to examine. Uh, you're also likely to see uh, the FSOC examine the, the treasury market and the structure of treasury market. All of those issues are ones that came up um, uh, in uh, several reports that were done by the, the SEC, the Fed, and the Financial Stability Board on where weakness, uh, weaknesses uh, emerged during the financial turmoil from, from last year. And so the FSOC is likely to, to turn and take, examine those. Now, um, the other area that I just want to focus in on quickly, just moving to the next, sl next slide, one more, is uh, kind of what's happening in Congress and how the administration is pushing broader economic policy uh, through Congress at a, a pretty, pretty brisk pace, a pace actually we haven't seen uh, in probably 50 years. Next slide. The administration has already passed its American Rescue Plan, a $1.9 trillion uh, plan to uh, respond to the economic downturns uh, uh, caused by the, uh, the pandemic. 
Um, and now it's turned to two, just recently proposed two additional bills, uh, each about 1.9 to uh, two, 2 trillion. First is the infrastructure bill, which I, for sake of, of, of uh, time, I won't go through but, uh, in detail, but you can see the broad range of spending that will be going on. This will be a huge amount uh, of, of, uh, uh, of spending, not just on traditional infrastructure bridge and bridges and ro roads, but also housing, healthcare, childcare, public schools. It's a very expansive spending list. Now, what I think is particularly uh, important for this audience to know, moving to the next slide, um, is um, the, the jobs plan does have a fair amount of provisions dealing with housing. The uh, Biden administration is really trying to push forward on moving, um, uh, eliminating exclusionary zoning, providing more uh, uh, assistance, uh, not only for low income housing, but for uh, as part of its climate change agenda, uh, retrofitting houses to make them more ener energy efficient. Uh, there's a lot of tax credits and support for um, uh, re renewables in this in, the, in this bill. Um, moving to the next slide, the other piece to understand about the American Jobs uh, Plan is that it is going to involve uh, significant uh, tax increases. Uh, most important, which is the increase of the corporate tax rate to 28 percent, a minimum global tax of, of 21 percent, and a, uh, a real uh, 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 strengthening of enforcement of corporate tax laws. Uh, the IRS is budget is likely to increase, well, which means likely more audits, audits of corporate tax, tax returns. Moving to the next slide, the other area of policy uh, that the Biden administration just announced last night was the American Families Plan, which is a very broad based um, plan uh, to provide uh, various social service support for families ranging from education uh, to expanded family and medical leave act to additional uh, child uh, uh, support uh, for, for children uh, of, who live in low income families. It's very broad, very big price tag, again, about $1.8 trillion. Um, moving to the next uh, slide, which also it comes with uh, a new round of tax increases with uh, the most significant ones being the individual uh, top rate moving to 39.6%. Uh, capital gains taxes moving to the individual rate, which would be the new 39.6% for individuals earning more than a million dollars. Also um, eliminating stepped up basis uh, for uh, certain real estate uh, tax, tax values um, um, to uh, uh, cut down on what the administration kind of views as tax dodging through the use of the inheritance tax. So uh, values of the states above one, uh, 1 million for individuals and 2.5 for, uh, for couples would be uh, would not be allowed to use the stepped up basis for passing to their heirs. In addition, um, they propose to eliminate 1031 exchanges for real estate gains above $500,000. And again, additional funding uh, for enforcement of, uh, uh, co of corporate uh, and uh, high income in individuals uh, tax returns. So you can see by that the tax situation is pretty fluid. There are changes coming. My view, it's um, what's the, about to happen now is Congress will uh, move forward on both of these bills uh, and make substantial changes. I think the tax side is the one that we're likely to see uh, the most fluidity on. I don't expect uh, the tax provisions to be adopted exactly as Biden proposed, but I do think the general trend is likely to see uh, increased on corporate uh, tax rates and uh, individuals to the, the degree will really depend on the congressional process. Um, I'll also note is that uh, the time frame for moving these bills is on an accelerated basis because they are looking to use a procedure known as um, a reconciliation, which allows for uh, expedited procedure of, 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 of legislation, and they don't have to go around uh, the, the filibuster. Then moving to the final area, I'll just note, go to the next slide. Is the uh, one area that I haven't talked about, which is housing finance reform. And the reason I haven't mentioned that up till now is that it's the big unknown with the administration. Uh, all we do know is that the Supreme Court is looking at the Collins v. Mnuchin case right now about the validity of the Third Amendment to the PSP, PSPCPAs for the uh, GSEs. Um, that decision uh, we expect to see sometime in May, early June. And at that, uh, after that decision comes down, we're likely to see the Biden administration uh, uh, give at least some indication of where the administration is likely to head on housing finance policy. And with that, let me turn to Krista, who will uh, give us an overview of the CFPB. 
And thanks, Andrew, and thanks everybody for listening to us. Um, before we move to the CFPB, I, Andrew had a couple of dots on that slide on HUD and fair housing. Um, and we know that that's going to be a priority of the agency. And you know, before you know, CFPB is one of many of the financial services regulators, and HUD does have jurisdiction for Fair Housing uh, Act discrimination. And you know, what I'd like to note there is that we've already seen an uptick in fair servicing complaints in this environment. So we've actually handled a two or three already this year, where borrowers who are in forbearance are looking to resolve delinquencies and CARES Act protections as their forbearances are coming to an end and they're filing discrimination complaints when they're not receiving the service that they think they need to and are entitled to under the the law and the federal regulations and so not only the borrower initiated complaints but we also think we'll see more um, HUD initiated complaints so there was only one secretary initiated complaint in 2020 but we expect that the agency will be more aggressive and um out there enforcing the Fair Housing Act itself, not just waiting for borrowers to file complaints. So with that, I'm gonna spend the last few minutes here um, providing an update of what we're seeing from the CFPB and what we expect the Bureau to do during the Biden administration. So I'm just, this first slide is really just some background on the US Supreme Court case from last year. And the upshot really is, is that as a result, the director of the CFPB is now removable at will by the president. And we saw that actually in action at the very beginning of the Biden administration when Director Kraniger resigned at President Biden's request right at, I think, day one of the, the new administration. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we'll look at what's what's coming in the future. And that is that, and most of you already know this, I'm sure President Biden has nominated Rohit Chopra to be the next CFPB director. Mr. Chopra is currently serving as a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission and was the former student loan ombudsman at the CFPB before in a prior tenure. So he has had his confirmation hearing back in early March before the Senate Banking Committee. And it's widely expected that he will be confirmed by the full Senate. That confirmation is being held up um, in part because there is another vacant seat on the FTC that needs to be filled to avoid a 2-1 Republican majority. So while we think that, that this will happen, the timing of it is a little bit uncertain because there are so many moving parts as the administration is filling seats. And you know, as Andrew said, this isn't the only agency that's now being run by an acting director. So if we go to the next slide, um, I wanna talk about approaches to enforcement. So under Director Kraninger's tenure, we did see a fair number of public enforcement actions over the last two years. Um, and there were predominantly involving unfair deceptive acts and practices and abusive practices in those claims. And we know, though, from FOIA data that we've seen that the CFPB opened a much smaller number of new investigations in those years. And just based on the public actions that were announced, we know that they were targeting smaller firms at what, you know, really involving fraud. And they were looking to provide monetary redress rather than um, consumer restitution or penalties, less so than we saw in the prior Obama administration, CFPB. And we expect that to change. Um, Mr. Chopra has been a very prolific writer of dissents and concurring opinions during his time with the FTC. And if you look at those writings, you can see a couple of themes emerge. Um, the first one is that he's an advocate of using all of the agency's powers. Um, and I think this will be less of an issue at the CFPB than it has been for him at the FTC because the CFPB's authorities are much broader. But we think that that will translate into a more aggressive and creative theories as they pursue enforcement. Um, we think that they, his uh, CFPB will be more robust in trying to obtain monetary redress, both in terms of making consumers whole and imposing penalties. So we definitely think we'll see more aggressive settlement demands and higher uh, dollar amounts in settlements as they're announced. Um, third, he's written repeatedly about how important it is to go after bigger players in the marketplace. So we definitely see, think we'll see more investigations of larger financial institutions and non-bank companies. And he's also written about his willingness to litigate. So we think that even where the law isn't as clear as, it, as the CFPB may like it in order to address issues that they're identifying through their supervision and investigations, we think that there may be a greater willingness to pursue creative legal theories through litigation. And so if we go to this last slide, um, 
we've put here, which is just as important as what type of enforcement posture we'll see out of the agency, but what are the areas of focus that we think the agency will prioritize? And so I've given a pretty long list here, and I know we are running out of time, so I'll try to focus on the ones that are the most relevant to this audience. And obviously that's going to be the mortgage servicing and debt collection space. And with regard to these two spots, the CFPB is already active under the acting director. They've issued a proposed rule in which they're contemplating new provisions to RESPA's Regulation X to protect borrowers who have been affected by the COVID-19 national emergency. And the most important proposal there would be a rule that would create a pre-foreclosure review period. And what that means very quickly is, is that currently under the CFPB's regulations, servicers are prohibited from initiating foreclosure until a borrower is 120 days or more delinquent. And with the impending expiration of COVID-19 protections and the foreclosure moratoriums that have been issued and extended several times by the federal housing agencies and the GSEs that are subject to the CARES Act, the concern by the CFPB is that borrowers with severe delinquencies who may not have yet engaged with their servicer are going to be rushed through the foreclosure process. And the rules pre-foreclosure review period would generally prohibit foreclosure initiation or the filing of that first notice of foreclosure until after December 31st of 2021. There are a couple of other provisions about outreach and available loss mitigation under RegEx and comments are due on that rule on May 10th. So obviously the CFPB is moving very quickly to try to get those additional protections in place with regard to the COVID-19 servicing issues. And with regard to debt collection, the CFPB has issued final rules under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that focus on communications with borrowers and communications regarding time-barred debt. Now these regulatory changes were issued late last year under the prior administration and were slated to take effect in November, but the CFPB has proposed pushing that effective date out until the end of January of next year, as they say, to give parties more time to comply with the ongoing pandemic. But we have seen the CFPB push a couple of the prior administration's regulations out. And in, you know the, the stated reason has been because of the national, pan, um, the national emergency, but it's also obviously an opportunity to give the new Biden administration a chance to review the rules and determine if they wanna move forward with them. And then just last week, the CFPB issued an interim final rule, which will become effective, I think, Monday on May 3rd. And this one is also under the FDCPA, and it's going to require debt collectors to notify tenants about their rights under the CDC's moratorium on residential evictions for non-payment of rent. So clearly they're supporting that CFPB um, moratorium and making sure that servicers or, that, or debt collectors who are collecting rental payments are making sure borrowers understand their rights. Um, the other thing I want to say about debt collection is that in addition to all of these rulemakings, we definitely expect to see a sustained focus on debt collection and supervision and enforcement. So we think where we'll see the CFPB focus are, again, not surprisingly, the required forbearances and other COVID-19 related protections and whether not only first party collectors, but also third party collectors are engaging in conduct that the conduct that the CFPB considers to be compliant and not rises to the level of EDAP. Um, we also think communi consumer communications are going to be laser focus of the CFPB. Now, while those new rules that I just mentioned that deal with communications may not go into effect until later, you know, early next year, um, there's nothing to stop the CFPB from asserting that conduct that would violate that rule is currently a UDAP uh, violation today. Credit reporting has been a huge focus of the CFPB during the, the pandemic, and we think that will continue to be a focus of their supervision and enforcement where they find issues. And one other area that we've seen them um, be active in is in state law issues. So we've seen the CFPB bring several actions where they assert that violations of state law constitute UDAP. And we certainly expect that to continue, particularly in the debt collection space, where there can be some really tricky and specific state law requirements that we've seen the CFPB draw up and cite in their, um, in their enforcement actions. I know we are very close to running out of time, so I'll just note one more, although I know there's more on the slides. It, Andrew mentioned, and I kind of talked through the fair lending enforcement. We definitely think that we'll, you know, we'll see a comeback on the CFPB's side as well. 
under Director Cordray, the Bureau settled around 12 fair lending enforcement matters, but after he left, the Bureau's fair lending office effectively lost all of its power. And we know that that pendulum is going to swing back because we've already heard confirmation of this from the acting director who issued a statement last month indicating that this is one of the top priorities of the administration is to address racial e equity. And we also think, based on some of the commentary that Mr. Chopper's made in other forums, that he'll continue. And also, um, we expect to see a return of the reliance on the disparate impact theory of liability and potentially using um, algorithm algorithmic um, evaluations. Because we, you know, based on statements that that Mr. Chopper's made in the past. Um, he, he definitely believes that just because you have an objective and neutral input in an algorithm, that doesn't necessarily guarantee neutral outcomes. So I definitely think that we will um, go back in time to some of the theories that we've seen before and certainly see a more aggressive and um, engaged regulator in the CFPB under the Biden administration. Well, hello everyone. It's uh, Paul Jorison and Mayor Brown and John. I wasn't sure whether you're going to pop back in and um, perhaps um, wrap up that panel with a thought or two. But if not, um, let me move ahead with our next panel. Um, the panel um, uh, we're going to turn to is about asset finance, um, and asset finance is key, of course, to, uh, uh, to to REITs and the associated leverage and the products that are involved in. Today, we've got a nice panel um, to talk to you about this and featuring um, Joe O'Dockerty. Joe is with Barclays, where he's a, a managing director and he's the head of their mortgage securitization and uh, head of their financing origination business. So, Joe has been at the coalface of all of the ups and downs for the last year or so. And I know he's got a lot of interesting remarks to share with you. And, I'm also joined by my finance partners, Hawker Goodmanson and Susanna Schmidt, who have been active, of course, in the last year. And Tom Humphreys, um, my tax partner, um, has been, um, you know, kind of a leading light in the, uh, the structured finance and finance tax space for many years. And Tom's been doing a lot of thinking about new asset types for REIT. And uh, with the, the rise of renewables and solar, um, increasingly, um, he's being asked to take a close look at the parts of that that work for REITs, the parts of it that don't, and some of the hurdles um, that lie over the horizon to making it work. And so we thought that given the uh, uh, the uptick in interest in renewables and the, uh, of course, the, the thirst for REITs for readable assets that understand the lay of the land there might be uh, an interesting thing to introduce. It's been an extraordinary year, of course, in asset finance and securitization. Um, I think we've probably seen unprecedented levels of financing activity, a lot of volatility, and also a good amount of innovation, which I hope that we touch on today. And that coupled with uh, the search for yield and the attendant use of leverage to create levered yield um, means that the financing activity has been more focused, intense, and often, you know, creative than we've ever seen before. So that makes for an interesting year and hopefully um, an interesting panel. We talk a bit um, in the few slides that follow about some of the key trends that have driven activity. And uh, you know, the first trend, obviously, um, is COVID and GSE actions. The GSEs are huge players in the mortgage space. Um, every time they touch something, it tends to change the equilibrium. And you know, if we rewind the tape back to last year at this time, I think the phones were ringing off the hook talking about non-mark-to-market facilities. And I know from experience that Barclays was among the first to work with some of our clients on uh, responding to uh, the need for mark-to-markets. Of course, I don't know the phones ring as much anymore there, Joe, but um, talk to us a little bit about uh, the role Barclays, what you saw in the non mark to market space, the pros and the cons. Um, pick up on this theme, please. Great. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, you know, I, I mean, this may be a slight repeat, but I mean, I think it's just a good remember kind of how this all played out. Um, you know, the COVID crisis occurred, which, you know, started and very much is a, a medical crisis. 
uh, but it also quickly created some financial distress. I think that was most obvious to people in the commercial real estate sector at first. Um, and commercial real estate assets, just like every other asset under the sun pre COVID was very highly levered, uh, and often through by investors, um, through mark to market facilities. Uh, so the first, I'd say significant margin call activity started in the CRE space. Uh, it was compounded, I would say by the, uh, good intentions of the fed who uh, in order to stimulate the economy, which is definitely the right call. They did that with, I would say a sledgehammer and caused the mortgage rates to move. I think it was a, like a hundred basis points, if not in a day, in a week, um, that exacerbated the mark to market action, both for originators of whole loans who, uh, hedged their assets with uh, TVA securities that is Ford settlement mortgage bonds, but also, um, for investors such as REITs who purchase um, mortgage securities and, and hedge those and or finance those uh, through repo, suddenly the value of those securities moved dramatically um, and there was a lot of margin call action. Uh, so you had the CRE happening, you had the MBS action causing cash flows to leave clients very quickly. And then what happened is our, those same investors owned other non-agency mortgage bonds, and they also owned whole loans. And when you default on a facility, basically every facility you have is defaulted. So suddenly every asset out there was potentially on auction uh, by repo lenders. So this made that contagion spread to price action and non-agency uh, securities whole loans, and uh, one area in particular was mortgage servicing rights. Uh, mortgage servicing rights pre, uh, pre-COVID were trading on top of the spreads for um, regular non-agency securities, which are truly bankruptcy remote in their analysis. Mortgage servicing rights, for many reasons, are not strictly bankruptcy, are not bankruptcy remote, of the servicer at least. Um, and so there was a large price dislocation on those assets um, during the COVID crisis. So that precipitated, just as Paul had mentioned, the need for rescue financing. And, and thank you, as you noted, Barclays was definitely a participant in that rescue financing. And not surprisingly, rescue financing doesn't typically come from traditional players, because if you think about it, if your industry is under assault, you probably don't have the dry powder to be a savior. Uh, so a lot of the rescue financing came from non-traditional players, frankly, players who always shied away from mark to market risk because they didn't have to participate in the mortgage arena. And on top of that, anyone who was a traditional player who had survived was definitely looking for ways to reduce their mark to market risk. So there was a great demand for non-mark to market facilities. Um, and, and I would say that demand lasted, I would say at least three months, which seems like a short window. Um, and the reason that demand has definitely subsided, definitely still there, but it's not nearly as urgent and pressing as it was um, at the beginning, is that the securitization market itself recovered so quickly and issuance began flowing out. And you know those people who were unfortunately caught up in it were essentially resolved and those who are not caught up in it were back on their feet and securitizing. And so, you know, there is no better non mark to market financing than a term securitization because it's it's match funded. Um, so even if you still funded all of your warehouse under mark to market repo, but you termed out 90% of your warehouse, you've reduced your mark to market risk by 90%. And that's really what we've seen our counterparties do. Um, so we still are getting the demand for non mark to market, but I would not say it's nearly as urgent. Um, and I, you might ask, look, well, why wouldn't you take non mark to market um, if you could get it? And, and there is there is a cost to non mark to market, and that cost is primarily in the form of additional equity required. Uh, the mark to market allows lenders to advance a much higher level on the asset because they have the ability to call for additional collateral if needed. 
in non mark to market uh, the haircuts, I would say, are typically at least 5% higher than on uh, mark-to-market facilities. And in particular, on the higher advance rate assets, some of which have only a haircut of 5% itself, that could be a doubling of the capital required. So as you can imagine, that really increases your cost of capital. Um, there's also some additional financing costs, but I think the biggest driver is really the capital required. So we've seen a lot of our counterparties who were definitely very interested in non-mark-to-market facilities uh, either reduce the amount they're looking for or really manage the risk by terming out and then not fully borrowing on their mark-to-market facilities, basically building in their own buffer. Uh, Paul, if you want to meet it. Well, um, you know, one area that um, basically created uh, Susanna Schmidt a whole new category of asset effectively in the world of um, warehouse finances, the entree of forbearance loans. Um, that can, kind of came out of nowhere and required uh, a revamp and rethinking of these facilities. Um, talk a little bit about that, please. Certainly, Paul. And I think that, you know, with the jolt that was the pandemic last year, we certainly saw across the board just, you know, a nationwide um, mark to market issue going on, whereas usually you see it in a little bit more of a concentrated way when you have a hurricane, let's say, that comes out and, you know, we've got some issues perhaps just off the coast of Florida or Texas. Um, this was, of course, nationwide, and certainly it was sort of how do we we deal with this risk and what's coming out of this. And one of the things that we we ended up seeing quite a bit of was the subclass of the forbearance loan, which I think helped to maintain some funding on assets that were perhaps a little bit more questionable than they would have been um, pre-pandemic. Uh, but certainly it didn't it didn't then rise to the level of a full-blown uh, delinquency in a facility where you needed to pull the asset out right away, which I think um, was certainly a helpful factor. Um, I think the other thing, back to what Joe was, was saying about sort of this, this shift to um, the non-mark-to-market space, I think, you know, we're, we're still seeing that, certainly a lesser demand, but it's how do you make these facilities sort of sit side-by-side, -side, mark to market and non-mark to market in a way that you can sort of hedge your risks in a, in a non-traditional way? And I think certainly some of that goes with the speed to which you can flip from a mark to market facility, which is certainly much more cost efficient to mark to market should you need it. Um, you know, one of the things, Joe, that you mentioned is that there's a bit of a trade-off uh, when borrowers go with uh, a non-mark-to-market structure, one of the trade-offs being leverage, and also the entree of, uh, call it, you know, permanent capital, so to speak, or rescue capital. And one innovation that we saw was kind of the marriage of those two things where um, through some, you know, creative contracting around repos, uh, effectively having uh, bank lenders hold senior positions in repo that's non mark to market and then bring in, you know, as you've seen um, some of the, the hedge fund guys who, um, you know, are, are more comfortable holding that riskier piece at the bottom. And some of the structures that I think have been done um, definitely has some staying power. And, uh, you know, we're seeing them, you know, come up in variants of them, you know, going forward. So, you know, even in some mark to market facilities, uh, having that kind of mez tranche, you know, in the really deeply subordinated piece with some extra juicy yield for some of the hedge fund players has been an interesting kind of outgrowth of the um, the mark to market or non mark to market structure at first. And now, you know, we're working on a couple of deals where it's finding its way into the actual mark to market structures. So. That's great. And where do you think this goes? I mean, is this is this kind of stabilized, Joe? So we're at a place where, um, you know, most of the folks who are going to have a non mark to market facility as part of their uh, treasury operations, so to speak, have, have put one in place or are you still seeing upticks of demand and ups and downs here? Uh, I think there's going to be continued demand for it. Um, uh, you know, I, I think everyone still sort of wants it to the extent it is. Um, available at a, a competitive price. Um, so I think everyone's still gonna ask for it. I do think though, uh, to the extent people are, are getting the velocity to market, that is the, the time they're sitting on the loans is relatively short. 
that the mark to market will probably be the greater um, greater executed type of facility. Well, our next couple categories of asset types um, had large increases in call it inventory driven almost entirely by GSE policy. On the EBO front, we saw uh, the Gini bulletin come out and effectively almost require a six or seven month holding period for a lot of EBO loans, totally changing the landscape. And at the same time, a lot of new entrants as investors in EBO product, uh, new funds coming into the space, um, additional bank buyers, some of the large um, banks are coming in and buying up portfolios. Some of these things being repooled, um, maybe even you know private deals getting done. You know, certainly, uh, Joe, there was a big area of activity in the last year or so. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. We've been financing EBOs since I think 2012, when it was really still an overhang from the global financial crisis and dealing with the five percent delinquency threshold. Um, and then really our, our focus and many others in the space had been on the reverse side where there is a continued need for buyouts. Uh, but COVID has definitely brought it back in a big way. Um, it was very interesting. Um, I would say Jenny was very quick in taking action, which I think was great. I don't think anyone expected them to act as quickly as they did. Um, but it was stepwise. So I think the very first plan allowed for the ability to take out a forbear loan and then repool immediately, uh, which I think Jenny decided was not a, uh, a great idea. And then I think it's a six month rule now, um, which is, you know, is funny unless you were the person who bought out a bunch of loans thinking you could repool them tomorrow. <laughs> um, and now I think it seems to have stabilized the six month holding period. Um, I think everyone's comfortable with that risk. Um, it is funny, just the very different viewpoints of the world. Um, you know, I, in a lot of ways I sit in the middle in that I, I deal with both servicers who this is not something they can choose to do or not do. They just have to deal with the reality of buying out loans when they have to. Uh, and then you have investors who see this as an opportunity to invest money. And like you said, there's really not a lot of great places to invest your money. So a new investment opportunity gets a lot of attention. Um, what I've noticed is that most of the financing asks are really coming from investors and not servicers. And, and what I'm seeing is really from the servicer originator. Uh, one of two choices. One choice is to say, hey, Right now, the 5% the rule doesn't exist, so I don't have to buy out. Um, I'm making a ton of money originating mortgages, and that's the best use of my capital. I don't want to buy out the loans. I'm just going to modify the loans and hope that I can, through modifications and reperformance, get below 5% anyway. Uh, and if I don't, then I'll, I'll buy them out then. There's another subset who are proactively saying, I don't want to have this hanging over me. But instead of them buying it out and sitting with the financing risk, they're selling to investors today. Um, so a lot of our activity today is really financing investors who are looking to buy the loans and making the bet that, hey, I'm going to get X percent to reperform, get paid 105 on the reperforms, which will more than offset the losses I take on the ones I have to ultimately liquidate. Which you do get your insurance payments, but you never quite get a hundred percent. So they're generally speaking a a discount asset. Um, so I'm um, trying to think for something else. Oh, on the term securitization front, um, you know, there are two rating agencies who are looking to rate bonds, um, and I, I believe deals are ready to go um, at this point. Um, the, there's really a choice the issuer has to make right now is you could either get a AAA rating and only do FHA buyouts, or you could get a capped rating. I believe that's a single A rating and include VA buyouts. Uh, the reason the FHA and VA have different, um, rating risk profiles is the FHA loans are essentially hundred percent guaranteed. 
except for known quantifiable uh, nicks and cuts you take to interest in certain fees. Uh, whereas on VA, it's a partial insurance. So you really need to model out uh, loss scenarios and figure out how much is covered by insurance versus not. And so you mentioned in Hawker um, Goodmanson, I think um, you're working on you know, some of the analogs, uh, Joe, between EBO and the HECM buyouts. And of course, we've seen a huge amount of reverse issuance, including HECM. Um, you know, Hawker, talk about that a little bit and what's on the horizon. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, like Joe said, we've had, there have been now for, I don't know, five or six years, quite a few. Like, um EBO securitizations, and and uh, um, I think that that market has has has, has kind of grown um, pretty nicely. Um, the, the the difference, I, the key difference, I guess, from a legal perspective, when you look at a uh, HECM EBO compared to like a standard RMBS deal, is that um, the, um, the the HECMs are not really Remicable assets, so you can't really uh, put them in a remic. Would put and so so most of the deals or all the deals, I think, uh, in that space are kind of debt for for tax deals. So you have to, you have pretty significant restrictions on how you tranche uh, the bonds. Are typically done with uh, you know a couple three tranches that then you know pay pro rata or, or there's some me mechanic then to kind of break the relationship if there's a um, uh, a, uh, a credit event, and, and you have to kind of trap cash in the in the deal once you pay it, pay down most of the senior bond if you if you go to that uh, scenario. But um, I think that the the EBO deals uh, on the forward side are going to have that same restriction um, or, or that same feature because uh, those loans like the the headcoms are kind of predominantly non-performing and, and therefore not easily subject to remix. So, so those, the, the HECM and the forward EBO deals that I think are gonna look from a legal perspective, uh, very similar. And I think Joe and I were talking a little bit yesterday about kind of the, the kind of the, 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 the rapid rate of repooling, which in, in the forward space is gonna, you know, shorten the duration of the bond and, and you know, my, people might kind of put in some revolving features like we have seen in, in some of the HECM deals, particularly in the uh, assignable uh, deals. Um, but, you know, other than that, I think they are very similar. The nice thing about them too, if you're comparing them to kind of regular RMBS deals is that they're uh, exempt from risk retention because the, the loans are, are, are guaranteed by um, the government. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so you have a little bit more flexibility there on, um, you know, selling down if if uh, if investors allow you to do that and uh, and uh, 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 retaining mm -hmm. whatever piece of the the, the stack kind of makes uh, most economic sense. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so it's interesting on EBOs. You know, heretofore, if you're holding EBOs, you're a servicer or an investor. If you're a non-bank, you're looking at warehouse lines or something like that as leverage. And uh, it's just a natural that the, the capital markets, the securitization market should be stepping in here. And especially with uh, the increase in inventories, it's going to be interesting to see those deals come to market. And uh, I bet you, as you're saying, they're going to bear a remarking, remarkable similarity to some of the uh, the assignable HECM deals. You know, uh, when when the GSE started changing their forbearance policy, there were many, many, many projections and articles talking about the need for servicing advances and the stress that would exist in uh, amongst the mortgage servicers. And certainly there was a good amount of stress. Happily, um, you know, the GSEs acted to uh, to mitigate a lot of that, but there was still a lot of opportunity there and um, a lot of challenge to boot, a lot of hard conversations and thinking um, some good discussions amongst industry groups, Joe. Um, you know, servicing advances has probably been an area um, where um, Mayor Brown clients have certainly seen a lot of Barclays over the years. That's kind of a, a bread and butter product, but uh, a lot of changes in the last year. 
Yes. Um, it's an asset class we've loved, I think, since 2004. Um, and, uh, you know, really the asset class uh, first sprung out of a need to finance all the non-agency advances, uh, which kept us all rather busy, I think, you know, through the global financial crisis and post. Um, and then it really kind of went into a dormant mode. And, and then COVID, just, just as you said, you know, uh, sound policies to do good things for one person often has unintended consequences for others. And, and that was the servicers. Um, these actions to help out homeowners, help people stay in their homes, especially the last thing you need is people on the street when they have COVID. Um, it put a financial stress on servicers. Um, I think the highest projection I heard was 50 billion in advances. I don't think I believe that number, but I, I believe some pretty high numbers. I think we ultimately projected that we'd have 10 billion in advances. We, I think, moved as quickly as possible within, I think, less than a month to offer out term sheets. I think we showed out probably $5 billion in term sheets for servicing advances. We ultimately had $3 billion in facilities out. Um, the utilization has been very, very low. Um, the agencies, I think rightly, as much as as a lender, I didn't mind it, uh, rightly found ways to either avoid the advances on the front end or through rapid reimbursement policies, uh, at least make the balance of advances remain quite low. And then the real surprise, and again, I, I think this is a good news story, the real surprise is just how well uh, homeowners performed on their mortgages. Um, in particular, um, you know, I, delinquencies never really got above, I think, 8% for the agency loans. They got pretty high for some of the non-QM deals. And I think that's a lot of it being, um, we'll call it non pay stub employees were probably the most affected if you had your own business. Um, but the truth is, even though you saw all the people apply for forbearance, a lot of people just kept paying. And I think the, the massive infusion of unemployment in some weird ways helped the lowest in the total pool the best. I think there was a period of time where people made more money on their unemployment than they were making when they were employed. So part of our, I think our performance to date has been something that is, I think, temporary. I assume temporary um, and it's certainly scheduled to go away. So I think 2022 will probably expose uh, people who are really not going to pay. You know, if, if you're still not paying by 2022, I think the, it's clearly an indication of your job is gone permanently. Um, so I think there will be an uptick in advances in 2022, but it looks like it'll be well satisfied by the, the financing capacity that's out there. Well, it'll be interesting to see if the labor market uh, can re be reabsorbed, um, you know, as the, the grand reopening continues. Um, an informal but um, leading indicator would be the ability of my son to actually get a job, um, perhaps washing dishes or something this summer. Uh, it, apparently, there are offers out there, so I'm delighted to see it. Let's uh, advance the, the slide here and just take through a couple more, um, you know, asset types, and then um, we'll we'll turn the page here. You know, here's some some key trends that. You know, we think are tied largely to demographics. Obviously, a lot of this is also driven by monetary stimulus. But boy, you know, in 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 recent history, it's hard to it's hard to identify an asset type that's gotten hotter faster than single family rental. On one hand, you know, you say to yourself, maybe, well, that's because there's so much to grow, right? If you compare single family rental to multifamily. Um, you know, just a microscopic piece of the uh, single family market, so to speak, uh, you know, is subject to uh, a rental arrangement. And so, you know, growth is, you know, hugely possible. But combine it with COVID, combine it with the great search for yield, available leverage, incredibly hospitable um, markets. And so here we are in the market seeing new entrants who are literally 
coming into the SFR market with um, virtually no historic experience. A lot of them are tech companies and they're thriving. Or we have um, some of the largest joint ventures in the world getting done with um, large home builders on build to rent deals and bringing in some of the most sophisticated um, you know, investment capital around. So it's all over the place. Um, and there's a lot of work developing the property management platforms and a huge need for financing and a lot of funds being raised. So the SFR space um, you know, has really taken off. But it started, of course, in um, 2020 with the moratorium scare, which is kind of unlike anything that we've ever seen. Um, no need to pay rents and moratoriums on rents, very unusual. Um, you know, the, the SFR space, um, you know, Joe, lots of growth there. How does, how does Barclays look at that? Uh, it's, it's funny, um, you know, when SFR, again, just to kind of rewind a little bit, like the global financial crisis, I think a lot of people viewed it as a trade. Um, you know, it clearly wasn't <laughs> um, pre-COVID. Uh, and as people built out the infrastructure for it, it really, really showed that there is rental demand and that rental demand, some subset of the population prefers a single family house versus a multifamily house. It's actually completely not shocking if you think about it. <laughs> um, and the current players did a really good job of turning it into a business and not a trade. And that is focusing on costs, making it run efficiently, um, doing lots of smart things to set it up in a way that was efficient. Um, you know, the business was still looking very attractive pre COVID just because of demographics. Paul, Paul you mentioned like just the, the demand for housing was outstripping the supply. And I think what was really kind of pushing it over the edge was that, you know, there was this belief that, um, I'm going to forget the name of the generation, <laughs> the uh, name of the generation, but the generation that, that all the people like myself complain about, uh, were not wanting uh, housing. Well, it turns out, guess what? They want housing. <laughs> um, you add on to that COVID and suddenly on top of all that pent up demand, you have increased the number of people who want to do low density housing versus high density housing. And, and so it was a perfect storm of positive news. Um, so SFR went from a horrible scare where people were wondering, how can you do a securitization when no one's paying rent to, well, people are paying rent, you know, not a hundred percent of them, but you know, the cash flow is actually pretty good. And investors said, yes, and I know that those houses are going up in value anyway. Um, so if I have to put my money to work, SFR is a great place to do it. Add on top of that, um, Paul, Paul, you mentioned this is, uh, again, I, I think these are all good things that the government has done, but we have put in a, an enormous amount of money. I would use a different word, but I want to be appropriate here. Enormous amount of money into the system. And, um, I'm certainly in the camp of that's probably going to be inflationary. Um, definitely people will have different views, but if you wanted to find a place to put your money to work in a world where all assets have offer terrible yields uh, and equities, you know, by any traditional measure are, are, are very expensive. Um, single family rentals offers you the upside of the demographic benefits. And then the protection that if inflation does kick in, housing tends to do very well in inflationary environments. So we've seen a lot of people who are non-traditional, kind of going back to the trade aspect of this, coming in to put money to work in this space. So, uh, you know, I, um, it is my number one topic I get asked about. Uh, and it's the number one topic where it's a non-traditional player coming in. Well, the property management piece of that, um, you know, was always viewed as the great challenge. And I remember talking to um, one of our clients who's worked fairly successfully over the years to build something. Um, and, you know, now, Lord knows they might end up being one of the largest property 
um, construction outfits effectively in the country, um, almost backing into it through SFR. And basically their admonition was, you know, if we had known how hard this would be, we never would have done it, <laughs> never would have done it. Because getting your arms around the geographical spread, uh, the logistics of it all is um, is quite challenging. But also, you know, now you can break it up and effectively be, um, you know, externally managed, if you will. And you can be a fund um, or a joint venture and go out and hire a pinnacle or, you know, hire someone to basically manage your properties and it can be done economically. And so adds new degrees of freedom for, you know, sleeves of capital that are, as you're saying, you know, interested in the space, but not interested in, you know, building a captive property manager and, you know, having to go through all the renovation and construction activity. We've seen some, you know, structural evolution there, Hawker. And would you like to um, share any thoughts on the SFR space? I know you've been um, active in that for, for several years now. Um, yeah, Paul, I, I, I think Susanna had something that she was going to talk about here on, on, on this one, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think some of it, too, is just to echo what Joe was saying, um, in terms of we, we've seen this influx of millennials who finally have started buying houses, it's increasing the cost of housing. The other component to this is we have you've got housing values going up, all of a sudden for, for many other people, it's hard to enter a market where you've got housing values going up in the same way that, that they have been going up over the last 10 months or so. So I think the SFR market, um, one of the innovations that we've been seeing is a lot of, a lot of um, people have been focusing on rent to own scenarios um, and sort of how that then is playing into this market. I think that'll further help the housing market as we then see the shift from SFR to actual home ownership. Um, again, the, the, the key here is that there's a lot of upside just given the pent up demand or, or what we like to think of as the pent up demand among millennials has finally been like realized and, and they're entering the market. So I think that's where we're sort of seeing some of the structural changes. Some of these securitizations are being set up also so that as you see property appreciation, typically they're five or 10 year deals and uh, they now allow the uh, the sponsor to basically peel off, you know, the excess collateral that's not required to support the subordination levels in the deal. So, you know, clearly uh, an interesting evolution that speaks to the underlying strength of the HPA. And, um, you know, that's even on structures that obviously are fairly highly levered to start with. So, um, you know, interesting stuff, you know, fix and flip, you know, maybe kind of a kissing cousin of single family rental. Um, you know, how about, let me hit you up there, Hawker, and some of the legal structures that we see um, on fix and flip, because, uh, you know, that's an interesting product, obviously, with um, redraws and effectively construction loans and the like. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, we, we already talked about the similarities between the kind of the, the HECM deals and the, and the EBO, forward EBO deals. And I, and I think that the fix and flip deals kind of the securitization at least tend to be structured uh, along those same lines there um, because of the uh, subsequent draw features and the, and the kind of relative short duration. They, they kind of tend to have a revolving feature and, and therefore are not really eligible for, for REMIX and, and so have kind of the similar bond structures as, as those kind of other two types of deals that we were talking about earlier. But there's been, and we've been doing quite a bit of these and, and, and there's been a lot of activity, I think, in the fix and flip securitization space for the last, I don't know, a couple of three years. It's hard to keep track these days, but um, um, there seems to be at least recently a, a pretty noticeable trend towards, you know, increased uh, flexibility in um, adding assets after the facts. We've seen some deals that, you know, have um, bondholders hold BFNs or, or even be contractually obligated to participate in, in upsizes. And, and that's a pretty kind of a, a new development. Uh, we've also seen um, the ability of uh, aggregators or sponsors to 
uh, you know, add new originators, new servicers with with pretty basic restrictions on 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 qualifications. There's there's obviously criteria for eligibility criteria for the loans, um, and that that set out you know LTV and and interests and and things like that, and some some basic parameters. But there's there's a lot of flexibility to you know, um, put in loans from different originators and, 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 and add servicers and, and asset managers after you close the deal. And so you're gonna, um, you know, have a, a, a initial pool in, in these uh, transactions that's, uh, you know, potentially looks a lot different um, than what you're gonna have in a, in a, in a year or so when uh, uh, you, be, you might have upsized and, and, and revolved uh, most of the pools uh, pool uh, by then. So, so that's uh, um, something that's kind of interesting and, and uh, I think has been uh, uh, developing here in the last maybe year or so. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, these have not been rated and I don't think that, I don't know how, how the rating agencies are gonna, gonna look at this when they, when they get, uh, get around to, to these deals. I don't know, Joe, if you have a, have a view. Good, good. And last, you know, a lot of um, the REIT clients, of course, have been um, active participants in the MSR space, you know, a very esoteric asset, but one that's, you know, near and dear to a lot of the mortgage REITs, especially those with, um, with servicers on board. They understand the asset, see the value, um, understand how to finance it. Um, on the other hand, also very attractive to call it sophisticated private capital, right? Um, there's a lot of yield there, but um, you know, requires pretty deep understanding of um, how the GSEs work and mortgage servicing in general. A um, good amount of risk um, to be understood and, and mitigated with proper arrangements with the GSEs, namely the acknowledgement agreement. So, you know, that kind of complexity and yield is a sweet spot for um, it's a sweet spot for leverage and, and for opportunity and you know, correspondingly, I think we've seen quite a bit of new financing that's been um, put in place in the MSR space this year. Um, Joe, you guys have been active kind of up and down that capital stack from, um, you know, call it uh, term warehouse down into securitizations and the like. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, where we've been and what lies over the horizon here. Sure. Um, again, I always like to bring things to pre-COVID first. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, MSR financing, um, you know, when you go way back, was really <clears throat> regional banks in the high yield market. Uh, then the securitization structure came to four, uh, which is important to remember that it, it's not really bankruptcy remote uh, because it is, is really effectuated through a full recourse repo into it. And MSR, just the nature of it, you can't be bankruptcy remote from the servicer. Um, the reason that's important to note is that the securitization structure really took off pre-COVID. And really, it was deemed a better way to finance because you had repo capacity. And then you'll remember back to the very beginning of our conversation, highly levered repo bonds didn't perform well. And in particular, the MSR bonds, in particular, the, the sub subordinate bonds, um, despite those having terrible price action during COVID, uh, in reality, you know, the performance of those bonds have all been just fine. And the securitization issuance has come back. It's come back very well. Um, however, and I think this is going to be a long-term trend, it is no longer on top of the non-agency execution. That is, there is a pricing differential for the same average life and credit rating on MSR bonds versus your traditional non-agency triple B bond. Um, but importantly, it's here to stay because that's still well inside of the most obvious alternative financing, which is the high yield market. So I, I definitely think this is a, a, a market that's going to continue to grow. You know, one of the things that we've seen in the last year or so is um, the so-called acknowledgement agreements here, because obviously an MSR asset only exists as long as there's a servicing contract. And since the GSEs have the prerogative literally to 
terminate a servicing contract with or without cause, the lender's asset can evaporate um, upon that termination. And so all the deals, of course, are set up with these acknowledgement agreements with the GSEs, which are themselves somewhat complex intercreditor agreements that give the lender some modicum of comfort. There's been a, a good amount of, um, you know, I think regulatory focus at the top at the uh, FHFA that's driven, you know, increasing, I'll just call it, um, focus by uh, Fannie and Freddie on these things. And um, they're already complex and they're trying to layer in, you know, additional features that put outside dates upon their exposure and the like. And, um, uh, you know, it takes a, an inner creditor agreement that always has been a little bit tricky and it adds um, a new layer, a new layer of complexity. And some of the negotiations that we've had with Freddie recently have been very productive and good. Um, they're very professional and responsive, but it definitely shows them taking a new line on um, things like cross collateralization and, like I said, some of the outside dates and the way that security interests are handled and respected. So um, I would definitely mark that as, as a development, still positive and constructive, but um, you know, part of the complexity of this asset, I guess, as I mentioned. Why don't we flip the page, um, go to our last slide before we turn over to, uh, to Tom and let him wrap it up with uh, the renewables. We've been talking about leverage, you know, um, basically for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. And um, you, you might have heard, I think, um, Joe, are you on the record as being under category C? We see inflation, it drives up rates. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Where does it go? So this might not be the most interactive, um, you know, format. If we were all in the room together upstairs, uh, I, I could look a few people, friends in the eyes and say, hey, what do you think? But um, if someone wants to chip in here with a view, you know, clause A, it goes on forever. Um, you know, right now it seems like it might. Um, but on the other hand, if you look in the rear view mirror for the last year, almost everything that happened, at least to my humble mind and to uh, folks I listen to is unpredictable. So Lord only knows where this is going, but it seems like um, uh, the federal government adheres to a new modern monetary theory. It, it could go out for a ways. So um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this topic and, and click on and, and talk a little bit about um, where you see the great leverage trade um, going in the next year or so? If we don't have any um, anyone who wants to step up and share a view, maybe I could turn it over to, uh, to Tom Humphreys. Again, Tom is going to talk a bit about um, a potential new REIT asset. Um, it's not a slam dunk. There's some challenges, but there are also some good opportunities here. Tom, please take it away. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, Tom Humphreys here, folks. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the right slide there. So we wanted to do something a little different uh, for this mortgage summit. We wanted to, to talk about uh, renewable assets in mortgage REITs. Um, you see it out there. You don't see a whole lot of it, at least from, from what I can tell. But, you know, you can imagine with a new administration with a real focus on renewables, there's going to be a lot of interest in how renewables get, get financed. And so the question, and we have already had this from our clients over the last several months, what kind of um, you know, renewable loans can I put in a real estate investment trust? And so that's what these slides are about. Um, the, the, the first thing I want to do is just make sure everybody's on the same page. And I hope or I think all you know, know these things, but, but just to make sure um, a, a REIT is a vehicle that if done properly, uh, does not pay federal income tax. And the, the Congress decided that that was appropriate, but only so long as the REIT was basically um, not in an active business. So they didn't want REITs out there competing with active businesses. On the other hand, there's a lot in real estate, for example, renting you know, thousands of apartments, it's pretty active. That's okay because within the parameters of the REIT rules are certain activities that are deemed to be passive. And when we come to renewables, we're going to see exactly where that line is drawn uh, really pretty clearly by what the government uh, has done uh, over the last several years. 
So remember, REITs don't pay tax. And the price of that is they have to be relatively passive. Um, what if you flunk the REIT requirements we're going to talk about? Well, it used to be you fell off a cliff and paid a corporate level tax and there wasn't much relief. Now you can fall off a cliff, although there's a lot of different ways you can save yourself. Even, uh, even so, REITs always want to be on the right side of that line and well within the right side of that line, uh, simply because the relief provisions, you know, they, they have their own set of requirements. And if you can't meet those, then yes, you're going to pay a corporate level tax. So those are the stakes for our mortgage REIT that wants to invest in renewables. So if we go to the next slide, um, Congress wanted REITs to be focused on real estate. I'm not going to go through each of the bullets on the slide, but the most important one is the 75% asset test. And um, yeah, I think that's on this slide, that's all you need to know because I think the next slide, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, there it is, 75% asset test. And what this is saying is that you, you want have to have at least 75% of your gross assets in real estate related assets. And you see there the second bullet point, interests in mortgages or loans secured by real estate are good assets for the 75% test. These tests are done quarterly. Um, and th this is going to be a real or, or one of the big constraints for REITs that want to invest in renewables. All right, let's go to the next slide. Income tests, they, they really track along with the asset tests. And the REIT every year has to have 75% uh, of its gross income from various good real estate sources. And as you can imagine, interest on a mortgage is a good real estate uh, a source of real estate income. And so, as I said, the two tests track each other. There's also a 95% gross income test. Now for that, any interest is good. So if you had 75% mortgage interest and then 25% um, you know, interest on non-mortgage loans, well, you would meet um, both the 75 and 95% tests. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So, um, as we said in, in a couple of slides ago, you have to have a loan that's secured by an interest in real property. Now, real property, we don't look at state law. Uh, we look at federal law to determine what real property is. And this has been a real um, area of controversy for the IRS and for taxpayers over the last several years. But the IRS finally, uh, that culminated in a, a set of regulations in 2016. Now remember that year because that's already five years ago and it may not reflect what's going on today. Let's go on to the next slide. There's a definition of real property and basically land and improvements to land. And that includes what they call inherently permanent structures. Um, and uh, you can see there, there's some examples. If we could go to the next slide. Um, one of the requirements of the regulations is when a REIT makes a loan on property, and if if it, you've got a structural component and then a building, for example, an air conditioner or a solar system, if you have those, the, the solar system or the air conditioner is a structural component, the REIT has, to, the loan has to be on both the, um, the building and the structural component. In other words, the government drew the line. They don't want REITs just loaning against those solar panels uh, on the roof of a building. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so here's our, here, I've got three cases here in the moments remaining. And um, this is an easy one. So here our REIT is just loaning and the loan is secured by the land that's um, you know, on which the solar facility or the wind facility is built. No security interest in the turbines or solar panels and so that's going to be easily a loan secured by an interest in real estate. Let's go on to uh, case number two, and these cases get harder. So here, and I alluded to this earlier, you've got a mortgage on an office building, and the loan is secured by everything, including the solar assets, which is a solar array on the roof. And here, um, the solar array is used to power the building, and that's going to be a very important fact 
Um, that's going to put it into, and we'll see some examples in the regulation in just a second, but that will put it into qualifying asset land. Um, what if the REIT sells the, uh, some of the uh, electricity? Within reason, that can be done. You can sell the electricity, um, you know, excess electricity you generate, but there is a limit the IRS has um, that, uh, that limits that to really incidental sort of sales of, of electricity. And then, as I said earlier, what if you make the loan and it's only secured by the solar assets? Well, that's just not, that's just not going to work under the regulations. Then finally, and let's go to the next slide. We've got, this is, this is the whole kit and caboodle. You make a loan secured by a, everything uh, with a solar facility, land, the solar cell, the mounts for the cells of the cells and the exit wires. And so how's that one gonna turn out? Let's then go to the next slide. Um, and these, this is right out of the regulations. And this was a hard fought battle between taxpayers and the IRS over what would qualify. I'm not gonna read you each of those words, but I do want you to focus on the very last bullet point. The piece of property that does not qualify as real estate or a structural component are the actual solar modules, the fo photovoltaic mod mod modules in uh, the example in the regulations. And why is that? Because the government feels that they have an active function or the government's position is they have an active function. They convert sunlight into electricity and you've crossed the line. The line I told you about earlier, a REIT cannot be in an active business. And so there you see the line for renewables and REITs. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, this just summarizes each of those components, which we call distinct assets under the REIT rules. Land, okay. Mounts for the solar panels, okay. Next slide. Um, solar panels, not okay. And then let's go to the next slide. Now, if we look at, and the, there are two examples. One is the example I just told you about, the, ent the entire solar facility. There's also the building with the solar panels. And as we said before, that's gonna be okay. As long as those solar panels are only powering the building, then that loan will be secured by an interest in real property. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We're almost out of slides. Ah, I've written down the results. And you see there uh, sort of a summary of, of what's happening. Now, one other uh, uh, question that, that comes up, what about a house? What about a house with solar panels and you've got a loan? And let's say you can do this you know, under state law. You've got a loan that's secured by the house and by the solar panels. Is that going to be a good um, mortgage for REIT purposes? Well, if you look at the example about the corporate office building, those solar panels only power the house. So that would, that would, um, that would indicate that, that that might be possible. Also, um, that I, it goes back to the notion these regulations were done in 2016, and here we are in 2021, and this is happening, I'm sure. For example, in California, any new house has to be solar pow powered or has to have solar power. So um, you can argue under the regulations that that should be okay. And then finally, there is a 15% rule. So let's say you make that loan and the value of the solar panels is less than 15% of the um, value of the entire collateral, the house, land, and the solar panels, then that's okay too. There's a de minimis rule in other words, and so that loan might be okay as well. So apologies for stepping on your break, but that's what I know about REITs and renewables. Paul, back to you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Anna Pinedo. I'm a partner in the New York office of Mayor Brown in the Capital Markets Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome Jamie Smith. Uh, Jamie's an associate director at Ernst & Young Center for Board Matters. Uh, Jamie is gonna be giving us a perspective as part of the work that EY's Center for Board Matters does in terms of its outreach uh, to institutional investors uh, regarding 
what institutional investors expect to see from mortgage REITs um, with respect to proxy statements and more generally human capital disclosures and uh, ESG matters. And uh, delighted to have uh, my partners, David Freed and Brian Hirschberg um, to talk about some of the latest SEC developments. Uh, many of you may not yet have had an opportunity to meet David Freed. Um, David joined us at Mayor Brown in January. Um, so he is uh, one of our newest partners, but an old hand uh, in the REIT world, having um, spent uh, all of his career really focusing on both um, equity and mortgage REIT financing transactions, as well as M&A and corporate um, corporate advice to um, to REITs, and of course, many of you have had an opportunity uh, an opportunity to work with Brian um, over the last uh, couple of years. So I'm going to hand it over to David, who's going to get us started, and then um, to talk about uh, MDNA changes and uh, Regulation SK. Uh, then uh, Brian, uh, then Jamie, and then I will finish off with some predictions. We'll see how accurate they prove to be in the coming months on what um, you all should expect from um, our new SEC Chair Gensler. So, David, off to you. Sure. Thanks, Anna. I really appreciate the introduction and, and the opportunity to uh, to talk to you guys today about SK modernization as well as uh, changes to MDNA and how they impact everyone's business and SEC disclosure requirements. Um, so on August 26, the SEC adopted amendments to update the business description, legal proceedings, and risk factor disclosures that uh, companies make in registration statements, annual reports, quarterly reports. Um, in making these changes, the SEC really is continuing its principle-based approach to disclosure, um, and the intent of that is to simplify compliance for companies and improve information that's provided to investors in, in SEC filings. Um, the new rules uh, went into effect November 9th, 2020. So most public companies um, have, you know, they 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 have experience with these rules and updating their disclosures. Uh, they 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 applied these rules in filing their most recent 10Ks. Um, you know, one of the aspects of the rule that's probably near and dear to most public mortgage rates is um, the, the 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 risk factor disclosure and amendments to item 105. Um, so new item 105 relates to risk factor disclosure and it's aimed at really reducing boilerplate and generic risks, including risks that are used by companies. Um, similar industries have not been tailored to a specific, uh, you know, company specific profile. Um, to that end, the new rules require a summary of not more than two pages in the four part of the annual report if the discussion, if the risk factor discussion exceeds 15 pages. Um, and, it, and there's a change to the disclosure standard from most significant risks to material risks. Um, and there's required organization of risks under relevant headings really to make, you know, understanding of what's really important to investors uh, to understand as, you know, risks affecting, affecting the, uh, an investment in, 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 in a particular company. Um, and, you know, most, if not all mortgage REITs, you know, have risk factors that clearly exceed 15 pages. And we saw the inclusion of, you know, across the board of summary risks in 10 Ks, mostly in the, in the, in item 1A of, 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 of the 10 K, which is the, this specific item calling for risk factor disclosure. But we also saw it, you know, in some other places, less, now it's less frequent, but it was, you know, would typically appear like after your cautionary statement about forward looking statements. Um, uh, next slide, turning to the business description, um, the, the SEC amendments eliminate, a specific, you know, this is dealing with item 101 of SK, and the amendments eliminate specific five-year time frame for disclosure regarding the general development of, of a registrant's business, and instead require a discussion of the general development of the business with no prescribed time frame. Um, item 101A Item 101 has been amended to include basically a non-exclusive list of types of information that a registrant may need to disclose with disclosure of a particular topic only required to the extent um, that information is material to an understanding of the general development of the registrant's business. Um, and then item 101C, that which is the, 
the, the line item that requires a narrative description of the registrant's business also is now setting forth a non-exclusive list of, of disclosure topics that registrants are required to address, but only to the extent they're material. Um, these amendments really clarify that the specified disclosure topics are required only if they're material to an understanding of the business. And they revised the list of disclosure topics to include only a subset of topics that, are, that, were, that were previously contained in, in the old item 101. Um, they also add, which we will talk about later, human capital disclosure of human capital resources, and they expand the disclosure of governmental regulations um, to that, that impact the business to all governmental regulations that are material, um, as opposed to just you know disclosure of environmental regulations. Um, we'll get into you know in more detail the, the human capital disclosures, but with respect to human capital, registrants are required to to include. Again, to the extent material to an understanding of the business, a description of the registrants, human capital resources, including the number of employees and any human capital measures or objectives that the registrant focuses on in managing the business. And I mean, this is very vague, a very vague requirement, and it kind of you know lays out sort of the principle based approach and gives you flexibility to decide what is material, what is important to investors, and as we, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about. The disclosure is, you know, varies from company to company, so there really is no set standard, and I think this is is probably a disclosure requirement that will evolve over time, um, and practice will change as as you know, as as registrants, you know, provide the disclosure and get in, you know, ha have back and forth conversation dialogue with, um, you know, with the with the SEC staff on when to the extent their comments and just watching what the market practice is and how it evolves in in a particular industry. Um, lastly, uh, the SEC also amended item 103, um, which deals with legal proceedings and the amendments to legal proceedings um, disclosure. Raise, it, it raises the, the threshold for disclosure of environmental proceedings to which a governmental authority is a party um, from 100,000 to 300,000. And there's flexibility for the company to select a different threshold. And that's outlined in the slide. So let's, um, let's move on to the uh, MDNA changes. So we go to the next the next slide. Yeah. So on, in in November of 2020, the SEC also also released final uh, final final rule amendments to item 303 of Regulation SK, and this is the item that deals with MDNA. Um, the rules are you know revised or eliminated several of the requirements of Regulation SK in addition to MDNA, including the selected financial disclosure in item 301. Um, the SEC adopted these changes again to eliminate duplicative disclosures, modernize and enhance MDNA disclosures for the benefit of investors, and making it simpler for, uh, for, for registrants to comply with the uh, with the disclosure requirements. Um, the, the new MDNA rules have an effective date of February 10th, 2021, um, and registrants are required to comply with the new rules uh, beginning with their first fiscal year ending on or after August 9th, 2021, and for a calendar year. Company that would mandatory compliance with the new rules would would, would take effect with your first ten you know your ten k for four, your ten k for the year ending December thirty first um, twenty twenty one um, voluntary there's voluntary early compliance and that's allowed at any time after the Feb the February ninth February tenth effective date as long as the disclosure is responsive to an amended item in its entirety um, you know many of you probably complied you know took had early com you know complied early with these requirements and started to you know streamline and eliminate du duplicative disclosure so now we can get into the the actual amendments um, next slide please. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so in, in the amendments, the, the SEC uh, amended 303A and to basically to clarify the objective of MDNA. Um, and it, it, the you know new item 303A codifies existing SEC guidance, and it requires re that requires registrants to disclose information that, based on management's assessment, is reasonably likely to have a material impact on future operations. Um, 
again, the disclosure is, is, is generally is expected to better allow an investor to view company to view the company and its, its its operating results and its financial condition from management's perspectives, and it's largely a codification of of, of existing SEC guidance here. They moved some you know some some of the some of what was currently in the general instructions item 303 to the actual 303 item 303 a um and they recaption 303 a and b to 303 b and 303 c um with, with with changes that are discussed later on um so next slide um the sec in new item 303 b1 and 303 b1 remnant 2 they they modified the disclosure applicable to liquidity and capital resources and what's really important here is the disclosure focuses on material cash requirements as opposed to just material ca capital expenditures um and you know it's it's in, in the the disclosure includes what we were previously uh, disclosing commitments for capital expenditures, but also broadening it to pick up things that are, you know, in, in, in essence, um, not, you know, capital investment, not, not only capital investments, but are cash outlays for things that investors are finding important, human capital, intellectual property. Um, the SEC is also specifying that you may have to break it down lower than this, you know, a, a segment level here and go to product lines to the extent it's, you know, necessary to understand um, your, your business. Uh, moving on to results of operations. And this is in uh, the new item 303B2, Romanet 2. Um, under this requirement, companies have to disclose known events that are reasonably likely to cause a material change in the relationship between costs and revenues, such as known or reasonably likely future increases in labor materials, price increases, inventory adjustments. Um, you know, very, very similar to the existing requirements and, you know, but the companies, what it specifically says is you have to disclose the reasons underlying material changes in, in net sales revenues. It eliminates specific disclosures with respect to the impact of inflation and changing prices. And again, it, it, while it, it's eliminated from the particular SK item, you still have to add disclosure here if it's part of a known trend or uncertainty that has had or is reasonably likely to have a material impact on net sales or revenue. Um, it allows companies to focus on material disclosure that is tailored to their business facts and circumstances. So it's it's eliminating certain items, but with the background of this principle based approach, you have to always keep in mind. Is this likely to have a material impact on 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 my results of operations, my financial condition is how is this affecting the objective that the SEC has laid out in 303A? Um, next slide. So the current requirement to disclose material off balance sheet arrangements has was eliminated, but again, this this plays back into this principle based approach that you have to consider the off balance sheet any off balance sheet arrangements within the broader context of MDNA. And there's a specific instruction that requires companies to discuss these discuss commitments and obligations arising from arrangements with unconsolidated entities or persons that have or reasonably likely to have a material current or future effect on all of the listed bullets in this slide. Um, next slide on tabular disclosure of contractual obligations. Um, again, this is a this is a disclosure that's eliminated and amended item 303B, which is liquidity and capital resources, and requires disclosure of material cash requirements from known contractual and other obligations as part of, you know, would pick would pick up what you had previously disclosed in a tabular format. So it's really it, it's it's a it it's not changing the substance of the disclosure. It's really just changing the, the form of the presentation here. And it's it, this is an example where I would say it's eliminating a you know duplicative disclosure requirement. Going on to the next slide. Um, line item changes and critical accounting estimates. Um, this was if the line item materially changes, um, you have to disclose the underlying reasons for these material changes in quantitative and qualitative terms that's specified in the new rules. The disclosure of critical accounting estimates um, is, it, it, you know, it's it, it's explicitly required. And you know what is focused on here is information that's necessary to understand the estimation of uncertainty and the impact of the the critical accounting estimate has or is reasonably 
likely to have on financial condition or results of operations. Um, item 303C for quarterly periods, the companies can compare their most recent recently completed quarter to either a corresponding quarter of the prior year or the immediately preceding quarter. Um, it gives you a little bit more flexibility to do comparisons of period over period where before it was just, you know, the comparable period from the prior period from the prior year. Um, if there's, if the comparison from the prior interim period changes, you have to explain the reason for the change and present both comparisons of the filing where the change is announced. Um, and as stated before, um, the next slide, uh, the, the new rules basically, you know, they eliminate uh, item 301, which is your selective financial data. So you're no, lo no longer required to include five years of selective financial data. Again, this feeds back into the principle based approach and uh, to MDNA. And uh, if there is a known trend in the in what you would be showing in that, what you have been showing in the selected financial data, it would now be, you know, you're still required to disclose that in MDNA. Um, it's just not in a tabular format with five years of prescribed line items from your, you know, from your financial statements. Um, they also they also made some made some slight tweaks to to item 302 and quarterly you know quarterly information um, to explain in the slide as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian and he can talk about changes to financial statements. Thanks, David. Yep. Um, so as said, I'm going to uh, transition to financial disclosure amendments. Uh, last year, uh, about a year ago at this time in May, the SEC adopted. Uh, changes to Regulation SX's Rule 314 and 305. So these are the rules that relate to significant acquisitions or dispositions. Uh, related amendments were also made to the pro forma rules under Article 11 uh, and the disclosure rules under Form 8K. Uh, so next slide uh, provides a background on Rule 305. So Rule 305 continues to broadly apply to uh, any business acquisition except for a real estate operation for which uh, Rule 314 applies. So under the amended rule, a real estate operation is now defined as a business that generates substantially all of its revenues from uh, through the leasing of real property. So within this new real estate operation definition, the SEC is now using the term business instead of properties, which was the prior term that was used uh, in order to address uh, the acquisition of a real estate operation that may be made through an entity holding real property uh, under a lease or by uh, purchase of a direct interest in the real property. So as a result, mortgage REITs that generate non-leasing revenues uh, will continue generally to be businesses subject to 305. However, REITs that generate substantially all of their revenue through the leasing of real estate, uh, such as through, um, you know, uh, office properties or, or apartments, industrial buildings, whatever, will generally continue to be uh, real estate operations that will be subject to 314. So the next slide summarizes the new investment test, which is the first test that must be run to determine whether the financial disclosures are triggered under the rules. So the new 305 and 314 test requires uh, the acquirer's investments in the target, uh, in other words, the purchase price, uh, to be divided by the acquirer's average aggregate market uh, market value of its equity during the last five trading days. So if the acquirer has no market value, then the denominator is instead it's consolidated total assets as of the most recently uh, completed fiscal year. So from a practical perspective, two significant changes here were made to the investment test. Uh, the first 314's former 10% significance threshold is increased to 20%. Uh, this, of course, more closely aligns it to the investment test significance threshold under 305. Uh, and second, uh, in determining whether the thresholds have been satisfied, the denominator under 305 and 314 is changed uh, from uh, that book value, uh, so total assets, 
to a market value figure. This is the aggregate worldwide market of voting and non-voting equity uh, shares that, that I mentioned. So with respect to the numerator for the investment test for purposes of 314, uh, it excludes any debt that's secured by a property that is assumed by the purchaser when using the, the market value test, uh, when using that market value denominator. But if using the total assets denominator, because there is no market value, then the debt is included in the numerator. Uh, next slide. So turning to the second test, the revisions to the income test, uh, this now is the income and revenue test. So it requires a two-part determination. Uh, the determination is based on the lower of, of the following. So it's, it's first uh, the value of the acquirer's equity interest in the target's pre-tax income divided by the value of the acquirer's pre-tax income. So it's a pre-income tax uh, significance test. And then that is compared to the, the second component, which is the revenue component, uh, assuming the acquirer and the target have had material revenues during the past two years, then it's the acquirer's share of target's revenues divided by the acquirer's uh, total revenues for the most recently completed fiscal year. So again, the same threshold is used. The applicable significance is set at 20%. Uh, and the trigger is based on the lower of those two calculations. So the most significant change here is obviously the incorporation of the revenue component. This is designed to mitigate uh, results that are um, uh, based solely on pre-tax income. This is especially important for, for REITs that, that have uh, marginal or, or break even pre-tax income as the result of uh, depreciation. Um, or as a result of uh, infrequent expenses related to uh, impairment or litigation or whatnot that would have uh, a, a volatile result on uh, the pre-tax revenue side but would not impact the revenue side. So under the new rules, an acquirer will not breach the incomes uh, test uh, for the 20% threshold unless it uh, eclipses both the um, pre-tax income portion and the revenue uh, portion. So if it does, then the acquirer is permitted to use the lower of those two components to determine the number of periods for which 305 financials are required, which is our next slide. So here we, we set out a chart of the periods that are to be presented. Uh, most significantly, you'll notice that there's no longer a requirement for a third year of 305 financial statements. Uh, this kind of uh, streamlined consistency, this reform is, is, is in line and consistent with, with the reforms David was talking about uh, earlier with respect to the MDNA disclosures. Uh, in terms of the periods that are required for 305, uh, the two most recent fiscal years in any interim period uh, are required if the significance threshold exceeds 40%. Uh, and the most recent one year uh, and interim period is required if the significance level is between 20 and 40%. Uh, the most recent interim period requirement is a new rule uh, that effectively eliminates the need to provide the comparative interim period when only one year of audited uh, financial statements is required. Uh, conversely, for 314, uh, there is no 40% threshold test, so uh, only the most recent one year uh, and interim period is required for any significance above 20%. Uh, last point here, um, as part of the adoption of the amendments, the SEC confirmed that financial statements of lessees and guarantors of triple net leases with a single significant tenant are no longer required. So helpful there. Uh, next slide uh, moves on to pro formas. Um, Article 11 of SX, uh, of course, requires performance to accompany the 305 and 314 financials. Uh, the pro formas need to be filed on their own um, in cases involving significant acquisitions and dispositions. Um, as is the case, the, the pro formas incorporate the, uh, the historical information of the, the target and 
uh, are comprised of a, a recent balance sheet and um, recent annual and in, in interim uh, income statements. Uh, the pro forma is importantly it, with the with the new rule for a significant acquisition or disposition is is again set at that 20% significant threshold. So that's um, that's uh, important. So next slide, uh, we talk about the, how the amended rules character, characterize certain individually insignificant acquisitions. So these are grouped together in in three different categories. Uh, the first category of, of individually insignificant acquisition is, is any uh, completed acquisition that, of course, doesn't meet that 20% significance test. The second is for probable acquisitions that um, whose significance don't exceed the 50% uh, threshold. And the third category is grace period acquisitions. So these are acquisitions that exceed 20% but are under 50%. Uh, and to which financial statements uh, have the 74-day the grace period under 305 or 314. Uh, importantly, for these categories, for individually insignificant acquisitions, 305 and 314 statements are no longer uh, required to be filed uh, at all. And so, for the most part, that eliminates uh, a lot of the uh, triggers um, that, that would have required immaterial or what are perceived to be as immaterial financial statements to, to be included. Uh, next slide. Um, the amendments to Article 11 do introduce uh, new adjustment criteria for the pro forma. So they're divided into three categories. Uh, you have the transaction accounting criteria, uh, autonomous entity adjustments, uh, and management adjustments. The first two are required under the rule. Um, transaction accounting adjustments relate to uh, the application of, of, of course, required accounting um, uh, treatment for the disposition of the acquisition. Um, the autonomous entity adjustments are adjustments that are necessary to reflect the operations and financial position of the, the registrant as an autonomous entity. This is typically for subsidiaries of entities that are filing registration statements for an IPO, in which court, in, in which case the independent operations of that entity need to be reflected um, separate and apart from its, its prior parent. Um, optional are the, uh, but encouraged by the SEC, are the management adjustments. These are designed to provide management with flexibility to include forward-looking uh, information that depicts the synergies and dissynergies uh, that management would identify uh, and provide insight to investors into the potential effects of the acquisition uh, and the post-acquisition uh, plans that are expected to be undertaken by, by management after uh, the consummation of the transaction. So our next slide here provides a few of the conditions for presenting those adjustments. Uh, number one, they need to be have a reasonable basis. Uh, the dissynergies need to be uh, presented alongside the synergies, and they need to be limited to um, uh, showing uh, the impact on the financial statements from the beginning of the period, so the beginning of the fiscal year that the pro formas are presenting. The next several slides here are uh, just providing uh, for your reference some practical uh, considerations relating to uh, the changes to the financial disclosure uh, rules, uh, most of which we've already covered here. So I'll skip a ahead, Melissa, and we'll do the, the CLE code. So it's 21 Horizon 04, 21 Horizon 04. And the next section, um, will cover um, uh, financial disclosures about guarantors and how that uh, is, is applicable uh, for, for upreads. So last year, uh, the SEC adopted amendments to 310 of Regulation SX. Um, these amendments took effect at the beginning of, of, of this year, so they're, they're now effective. And the amendments provide publicly traded REITs that operate through an upreed structure uh, with more flexibility to allow their OPs to offer and sell guaranteed debt securities and SEC registered offerings. 
without incurring additional expense of essentially having that OP to become a new uh, SEC reporting company. Uh, so next slide. In a typical UPRE structure, uh, publicly traded REIT uh, obviously controls its OP, but typically um, doesn't own 100% of the equity interest in the OP. So as a result, the OP had been previously ineligible for the 310 exemption under the prior formulation of the rule. So as a consequence, most publicly traded REITs needed to do 144A offerings or exempt offerings uh, instead of having their OPs you know, register uh, in order to proceed with that type of guaranteed debt issuance. Next slide. So these amendments, I'll quickly go through just a, a few of the most important practical changes. Number one, they replaced that condition of 100% equity ownership to just that the parent needs to consolidate it's uh, the, the, the OP's um, uh, financials onto its own. That, of course, is always the case uh, in the context of an upread, so that's, that's easy enough. Second, they now permit the amended uh, financial and non-financial disclosures to be provided outside of the parent REIT's footnotes, uh, so that's helpful, too, to keep them out of the financial statements. And third, they now only require the amended financial disclosures for as long as the subsidiary issuer or guarantor would have an Exchange Act reporting obligation, not so long as the guaranteed debt securities are outstanding, which was the prior rule. So next slide. Um, final couple notes just on these amendments. They also reduced the number of periods required to be presented. So to summarize, financial information is now only required to be provided for the most recently ended fiscal year and interim period. And finally, the amended disclosures expand the, the qualitative uh, disclosures about subsidiary issuers and guarantors uh, per requiring the terms and conditions of the guarantees to be described uh, and the other factors that may impact the payments to holders of guaranteed securities. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn the presentation uh, over to uh, to Jamie to cover the new human capital disclosures. Hi, thanks. Um, yes, I'm Jamie Smith. As Anna said, I'm an associate director with EY Center for Board Matters. Um, our mission is to support boards, committees, and directors in their oversight role by providing companies um, or by providing content insight and education to help them with complex boardroom topics such as human capital and ESG. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you today and I hope the information I present will be helpful. So let's get started with taking a look at the new human capital disclosure requirements, which David went over um, a little bit at a high level. So basically in August 2020, the SEC introduced a new requirement and registrants now have to provide a description of human capital resources to the extent material to an understanding of their business. Um, like the other changes the SEC made to its disclosure requirements, uh, this uses a principle-based approach. I do wanna highlight that this change did not occur in a vacuum. Um, various investor groups have been pushing for these types of disclosures for years in an effort to better understand how companies are integrating human capital considerations into their overarching strategy to create long-term value. Um, to that point, notably, the Human Capital Management Coalition submitted an SEC rulemaking petition in 2017 seeking enhanced human capital management disclosure. Um, back then, it was a group of 25 institutional investors representing around 2.8 trillion in assets. That group has since grown to 35 institutional investors representing over 6.6 .6 trillion in assets. And this group includes high profile investors such as CalPERS, CalSTRS, uh, Northern Trust and Legal and General Investment Management, which are among the top institutional holders of mortgage REITs. And then beyond this coalition, other top mortgage REIT holders such as BlackRock and Wellington Management and others um, support the development of disclosure on human capital issues, and they're making human capital an engagement priority um, with their portfolio companies. And put simply, I mean, these investors believe that companies that invest in and develop human capital are well positioned 
to realize a competitive advantage and deliver better business outcomes. And they view people strategy as strategy and want to understand how human capital management practices are contributing to long-term value creation. And I, I think this investor context is important to remember because it can help frame the new disclosures as an opportunity um, for companies to more fully tell their long-term value creation story and optimize their brand and reputation with key stakeholders. And I'll, I'll circle that back to that point later, but let's move to the next slide. I'm gonna talk for a little bit about um, what we've seen companies uh, disclose so far. <clears throat> so EY looked at 143 S&P 500 companies that had filed through February 15th. And I'll walk through the snapshot um, of what we found from that research. And I should note there were no mortgage REITs included in this research, but I think that these findings from other sectors can be relevant for this audience and help inform how mortgage REIT human capital disclosures uh, evolve going forward. Um, so that said, not surprisingly, we observed a wide range of length of human capital disclosures um, from a single paragraph to multiple pages. The majority of companies employed mostly qualitative disclosure, so describing how they considered human capital and then including a metric um, to underscore a point or explain a point. Uh, around two thirds of companies did include at least one specific figure or metric in addition to the number of employees. And so as examples of what some of those metrics were, um, some included a breakout of their employees by geography. Some did a breakout of employees by part and full-time employees. Um, some did a number or percentage of employees covered by collective bargaining agreements. And then gender was, was another metric used. Um, some others included attrition rates and employee engagement survey results, as well as injury incident rates. And this pie chart um, on the slide represents the frequency with which certain human capital disclosure themes were noted in the 10Ks. And the bigger, essentially the bigger the slice of pie, the more frequently this theme was discussed. The most common theme discussed was diversity and inclusion. And the majority of companies had at least a qualitative discussion of this topic. And more than a quarter of the companies included a metric showing the breakdown of employees by gender. And then a similar number also included specific figures around racial diversity. Um, another frequently discussed theme was employee learning and development. And these were generally narrative form disclosures about training programs and opportunities offered. And some companies supplemented this discussion with the dollar amount invested in training in 2020. Um, another frequently discussed theme was employee, employee benefits, and that includes health and wellness. Um, these disclosures uh, typically described the benefits offered to employees and highlighted how the companies are attracting and retaining uh, top talent through a variety of compensation and benefits means. And many companies also discuss their use of employee surveys to evaluate the level of satisfaction um, of their people in areas that could be improved. And as David said earlier, um, undoubtedly, we think these disclosures across all sectors are bound to evolve as a result of a number of factors, um, market and investor feedback, lessons learned from peer and sector practices, SEC comment and review process, um, as well as companies enhanced data and information gathering practices in future years. Now uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so 10 Ks are not the only SEC filing where we're seeing companies make human capital disclosures. Uh, we've also observed a dramatic increase in companies voluntarily highlighting human capital initiatives and commitments in their proxy statements which um, really is demonstrating responsiveness to their investors' interest in these issues. So, for example, in 2017, we found that around a third of Fortune 100 companies highlighted human capital initiatives and commitments in their proxies. That percentage jumped to nearly 80% last year. And taking a closer look, the, the chart on the right shows the top five human capital topics that were addressed by those disclosures. And as with the 10 Ks, workforce diversity was by far the top topic. Uh, nearly two thirds of the companies discussed their diversity initiatives, but only a subset of those companies, um, around 27%, 
included some measure of workforce diversity data. Um, most often they disclose the percentage of women and or minorities across the workforce or across certain leadership or management categories. Um, other popular topics included compensation, culture, health, well, health and wellness, and employee development. And similar to diversity, um, only a subset of the companies offered any quantitative measures of related performance. And those measures included things like undercompensation, uh, disclosing pay ratios for female to male employees or minority to non-minority employees or under development, um, some companies disclose the number of employees that participated in training and development programs or the average hours of training and development per employee. Um, as disclosures continue to evolve, we expect to see increased disclosure of quantitative metrics and an increased standardization of the metrics used within sectors. Importantly, another trend in the proxy disclosure, and I would say in governance practices more broadly, is um, we see companies explicitly assigning board or committee oversight of human capital. So in 2017, only 28% of the Fortune 100 company proxies explicitly disclosed that the board or a committee oversees human capital. And that grew to 69% last year. And um, we're finding that oversight is most often assigned to the comp committee, followed by the full board or another committee. Um, in most cases, the disclosures indicate that that oversight is inclusive of you know, human capital management broadly, but around a third of the disclosures did leave unclear whether the board or the committee was overseeing a spectrum of human capital factors or just one or two specific components like diversity or culture. Um, <clears throat> I'll note we've also seen a number of compensation committees change their name to reflect this expanded mandate around overseeing human capital. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, so here I wanna highlight what we at the center have been hearing directly from investors on this topic. So each year the EY Center for Board Matters engages with the governance specialists from a broad spectrum of institutional investors to understand their stewardship priorities and their evolving governance views. Um, and these investors include uh, large asset managers, public funds, labor funds, SRIs, faith-based investors, as well as some investor associations and advisors. So a very broad spectrum of investor, of, of asset managers and owners. And this past fall, we had conversations with more than 60 investors representing over 38 trillion in assets under management. And we asked them uh, about which disclosures would be of greatest value to them as they assess human capital management. And this chart highlights the top six responses we got. Again, you'll see workforce diversity topping the list by a long shot. Um, and that's followed by pay equity, uh, workforce stability, the number and type of employees, which I'll note that was um, largely driven by investor interest around company relationships to independent contractors, and then workforce health and safety and workforce education and reskilling. And just to be clear, <clears throat> when investors were talking to us about diversity, they weren't doing that through the lens of this is the right thing to do. Um, their views were very much grounded in the business case for diversity. And they discussed diversity both across the workforce and in the boardroom as being really central to a company's ability to innovate, to embrace change and attract and retain top talent. And so in line with that view that um, diversity should be a key priority to driving business value, around two thirds of the investors we surveyed said they will be pressing for robust workforce and board diversity disclosures in 2021 which is making diversity a top engagement priority this year. And most of those investors said that in terms of the workforce diversity data, they wanna see that aligned to, the, to EE01 data, at least as a baseline, and companies can supplement that with more company-specific disclosures as appropriate. Um, but investors noted that they are interested in the EE01 aligned data, both because they seek standardized data um, but also, since companies are already re already reporting EEO1 data, they thought that would be an easier lift 
um, and didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And then bringing these observations back to the mortgage REIT space, you know, I think these are really helpful ways to think about enhancing the broader ESG profiles of mortgage REITs. Um, I know mortgage REITs may face some limitations in terms of their influence over environmental factors, but human capital disclosures can really be an opportunity to shine. And even if staff sizes are significantly smaller, um, themes like diversity and pay equity, workforce stability, workforce training and development, and employee benefits are relevant regardless of the size of the workforce. Um, and it can be an important opportunity for the company to tell this story to the market. And I would say that to the extent there is external management, I understand uh, there may not always be full visibility into who's working the account, and a lot may depend on the structure and who the external manager is. Um, but, but I would say that mortgage REITs may consider asking related questions when they're evaluating their external manager and consider making uh, related disclosures to the extent appropriate. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I just want to keep broadening this um, to, the S, to the ESG profile more broadly. Um, during our investor outreach this fall, we asked investors what key ESG reporting enhancements they want companies to make. And most of their answers align to one of these uh, six tips on the slide. So one is to focus on what's material and the connection to strategy. Um, investors say they want reporting to focus on the ESG topics that intersect most directly with the business and that tie directly to strategy. So they don't want six pages of discussion on water stewardship from a financial services company. A fundamental step here is to do a fundamental step for the company is to do a materiality assessment. Um, and that involves engaging with the company's internal and external stakeholders to identify and prioritize the ESG topics that are most relevant to the business. And then the second point actually ties back into the first. And this is that investors want companies to align their disclosures to an external framework. Uh, they want this for a number of reasons. Uh, for one, investors seek a baseline level of standardized data to support comparability. They also want to make sure companies aren't uh, cherry picking disclosures to provide, but they also want disclosures to align to external frameworks because that can help support relevance. Um, for example, nearly all of the investors <clears throat> that we spoke with pointed to SASB as a decision useful framework. And for those of you who may not be familiar with SASB, the SASB standards identify the subset of ESG issues most relevant to financial performance in each of 77 industries. So in aligning uh, ESG disclosures to SASB, companies can help provide or help ensure that they're providing the most relevant data points from an investor perspective. And in terms of how mortgage REITs can think about aligning to SASB, SASB provides ESG data points related to asset management and custody activities, and also related to mortgage finance. Um, and I've seen mortgage REITs use um, either of these in their sustainability reports, and each could be relevant depending on the underlying business. So for example, some of the data points under asset management and custody activities category include the amount of assets under management by asset class that employ the integration of ESG issues. Uh, another data point is the percentage of gender and racial ethnic group representation for executive management, non-executive management, professionals, and all other employees. And then under SASB's mortgage finance, um, one of the data points is to include the number and value of residential mortgages of types such as hybrid or option adjustable rate mortgages or mortgages with a prepayment penalty or the number and value of mortgage loans in 100 year flood zones and a description of how climate change and other environmental risks are incorporated into mortgage origination and underwriting. <clears throat> so again, I think mortgage REITs can you know, carefully evaluate relevant industry standards and determine which standards align most with their business and then focus on some of the metrics that are most relevant for the company. And I, I'll say there's some outstanding um, we typically don't name um, company names as a policy at EY, but 
There are some outstanding mortgage rate sustainability reports that map to SASB and to GRI, um, so can really serve as, as an example of, of what can be done in this space. Number three is to disclose metrics, performance, and goals. I'd say the key point we heard here was that investors want quantitative data and they want to understand the metrics management is providing to the board to measure progress. And they want to see year over year performance against goals. Um, four is to consider integrating ESG materials or ESG disclosures alongside traditional financial metrics. And just to be clear here, investors understand that ESG reporting is a journey and they they view the integration of sustainability factors into financial reporting as the ultimate end game. Um, five is to enhance data credibility through assurance, and six is to make sure the company's disclosures are being accurately picked up by uh, third-party data aggregators. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, I, I, I just don't want us to overlook the G of ESG. There are a lot of enhancements mortgage REITs can make under the governance umbrella to enhance their ESG profile. And this slide highlights some of the disclosure trends we've observed related to governance, um, in particular around board composition. Investors are highly focused on the quality of directors they elect and the effectiveness of the board in exercising oversight as the company's strategy, uh, risk profile, and the business environment evolve. And we're seeing many leading companies disclose a board skills matrix that provides a snapshot of the skills and expertise represented on the board. And uh, the most successful of these make clear how these areas of expertise align to the company's uh, strategy and risks. Um, investors also want to see disclosure highlighting other dimensions of diversity on the board, particularly gender and racial diversity. And many companies are highlighting that diversity using graphics and the proxy, like these um, pie charts you see on the slide. And I would say that where diversity is, where board diversity is lacking, investors generally want to see disclosures that explain the board's efforts and goals to advance diversity in the boardroom, and they expect to see progress in this area. Um, one other disclosure, or, or one other trend here I'll note, is that we're seeing more companies highlight the diversity of tenure on the board, and discuss their approach to director succession planning. And we think these disclosures are gonna become more important in the coming years, given increasing investor focus on board tenure and director relevance. Um, a key theme from our conversations this year with investors is that um, they expressed a desire for boards to have a stronger discipline around turnover in the boardroom. Um, and many said that given the accelerating pace of change in today's business environment, the relevance of long tenured director skills and experience is increasingly less clear and the burden of proof is on the board. Um, we can go to the last slide. Um, just, just briefly in wrapping up, um, I just wanna frame this again as an opportunity. A mortgage REITs may have some perceived limitations regarding ESG reporting given the nature of the businesses, but there are a handful of leaders in the industry that have put out quite comprehensive ESG reports on topics like human capital, responsible investments, risk management, business, e business ethics, and environmental practices at corporate headquarters. So there are um, strong peer examples to consider. And with that, I will pass this back over to Anna. We can skip through those last slides there. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, so in our last few minutes, I'm just gonna give um, some brief comments on what we expect from um, from Chair uh, Gensler. So, um, as uh, as Andrew talked about, uh, we now have a a new SEC chair. Uh, Chairman Gensler has been in office for um, just a short period of time. Uh, there's a lot we know, obviously, um, about uh, his. Um, regulatory posture from his time at the CFTC um, and uh, from the tone he took um, in terms of implementing all of the rulemaking mandates uh, of Dodd-Frank when he was at the CFTC. Obviously, he took a very aggressive tone. He was one of the first regulators that um, was out in terms of rulemaking um, and uh, rolled out, uh, as we note on the slide, a flurry of rules. A lot of those have had to be 
um, adopted have had to be adjusted in in the years that have um, that have followed um, because they proved um, impractical um, and and just impossible um, to to oversee. So um, I suspect that uh, we can um, anticipate that uh, as SEC Chair Gensler is going to be similarly aggressive in terms of his approach to rulemaking at the agency. I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, the tone and character of the SEC has changed a great deal over the years while it remains one of our um, few independent agencies. Um, it's independent really in, in, in name only. Um, most of uh, the commissioners now have um, a political affiliation and come from um, congressional um, uh, congressional positions as opposed to um, in years past where they came from academia, um, from business roles or from law firm positions. And so it's a very different SEC um, in his early, um, in his setting his, his early um, key staff uh, positions. Gensler has already uh, named a few um, a few positions um, and many of those have been um, from um, Democratic uh, from the AFL-CIO and other um, other uh, entities that have strong um, Democratic ties. So I think we can expect more of the same um, when he um, when he makes his other appointments. So if we turn to the next slide in terms of the Quirk Finn agenda. A uh, couple of things that we anticipate, um, Andrew already talked about the SEC focus on climate change. Obviously, this has been uh, key to the Biden administration, and we already saw that a very, um, a very active acting chair, um, Chair Lee, in the interim period after Clayton had stepped down from the SEC and before Gensler had been appointed, took a number of steps at the SEC um, by uh, adopting a um, process for the review of climate change um, disclosures and soliciting public comments on the SEC's approach to climate change disclosure, um, issuing an ESG risk alert regarding how funds, in particular 40 Act funds, address ESG investments, um, and of course, um, adopting a, uh, a task force within the SEC focused on climate change. Uh, we've already talked quite a fair bit about human capital and diversity disclosures. Um, what we should expect to see um, are more mandates that are prescriptive in nature. And again, if we start from the premise that the SEC has become more of a political agency and less of an independent rulemaking agency, we can look to Congress for both of these next, you know, for this bullet point and the next bullet point for human capital, for diversity disclosures and political spending. So in prior sessions of Congress and also just last week, um, the House Financial Services Committee reported out several bills that I think lay out the framework for what we can assume that the SEC is going to propose in terms of disclosure rules for human capital, dis uh, diversity disclosures, and political spending disclosures. So um, H.R. 1187 is the ESG Disclosure Simplification Act. Um, it sets out very specific ESG metrics that companies would have to report. It also requires the creation of a sustainable finance advisory committee within the SEC. There's HR 1277, uh, the Improving Corporate Governance through, through Diversity Act, and that would require all public companies to report um, the racial, ethnic, gender, and uh, veteran affiliation of their directors. It also requires that public companies um, implement the diversity disclosures that uh, were recommended to the SEC by the SEC Advisory Committee. So I would take it almost as a given that uh, we'll see that come to fruition in the form of an SEC proposal. 
And then lastly, from our New York Congressman Greg Meeks, uh, the Shareholder Political Transparency Act, which would require that on a quarterly and an annual basis, public companies disclose all of their political donations. So all of that I would think is coming and coming soon um, to the SEC. Uh, on the next slide, um, good corporate hygiene. So here, um, this is less Gensler perhaps and more um, a continuation of what we saw from um, Chair Clayton. I think that we'll see Gensler continue to focus on some of these um, good corporate hygiene things. These are, this is the name um, for the initiative that was coined by Clayton and Hinman uh, during the last administration. So changes to the rules relating to um, company uh, repurchases, stock repurchases, of course, again, um, coming from the Hill and pressure from the Hill, there were various um, pieces of legislation that would reform or limit how companies can engage in repurchase activity. Um, rule 10 b one programs. So 10 b one is, is almost surely going to get uh, amended. Um, in February, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren sent a letter uh, to the SEC um, on the necessity of um, amending Rule 10b-51 and suggesting various amendments to 10b-51. Um, she used as sort of the, the lightning rod for the letter, um, the CEO of Pfizer's 10 b 51 program, um, he had amended his 10 b 51 program just days before the Pfizer vaccine had been announced and sort of mentioned all of the, the sales that uh, emanated from the trading program and cited to recent literature, including a Stanford professor's study that was announced in January on um, executive sales under 10 b 51 programs, which we've written about on our blog. Um, so, you know, I think that that's almost a sure thing. Um, and then lastly, um, reporting issues. Um, there are a couple of pieces of legislation that we've been watching for a while, the Brokaw Act and legislation on short positions. I think both of these um, are likely to, to um, take the form of SEC proposals, um, and in particular, because Gensler will be forced to wrestle with some of the issues that have come about because of GameStop and because of other market integrity and market manipulation um, issues that have come to light as a result of Robinhood, program trading, algorithmic trading. So I think that will continue um, to see a lot of focus regarding ownership reporting, reporting of shorting and short positions and so on. And next page, um, the same um, areas are likely to be areas of focus um, for enforcement. You might have seen that um, Gensler's first appointment uh, was the director of enforcement. Uh, she lasted five days. So he now has to, um, has a do over, he has to, appoint somebody new, um, but undoubtedly, these are the areas that they uh, will probably focus on. And then lastly, uh, something we've spoken about before, next slide, uh, and we'll leave you with it. Uh, this is a longer term issue. Um, we've written about this and we've spoken about this. Uh, the SEC has, um, it took great interest as did the banking agencies on the disruptions in uh, the repo market as a result of the COVID um, pandemic, particularly in the period from March through June. And uh, next slide, um, the FSOC has now um, taken this up um, in its last meeting, as was reported out, the FSOC um, started a discussion regarding the regulation of short-term wholesale funding. So um, since any regulation of short-term wholesale funding, funding would need to be a coordinated effort um, between the banking agencies and the SEC, this is likely to be a two to three year um, process. So 
not something that we'll see in the immediate near term, but certainly something that's highly relevant um, in terms of how it would affect um, users or, or those who rely on repo funding um, because we've seen it regulation of the repo markets have quite an effect on um, the availability of repo financing and the cost of repo financing in the European markets, which have now been subject to regulation for uh, a little uh, over a year and a half. I want to thank Carlos and Jessica for arranging all of this as usual uh, top flight work. I want to thank our special guests today who joined us from outside Mayor Brown, some of whom like Jen have participated three years in a row. And I also want to thank our Mayor Brown participants today and including our new partner, David Freed, who joined us earlier in the year. We appreciate the attendance and the privilege of everybody's time who joined us for the whole presentation or maybe parts of it. We really hope that you found it useful. At Mayor Brown, we've tried to build a top to bottom service platform for uh, REITs, particularly mortgage REITs. And you can see that in our regulatory capital markets financing and government relations expertise. We look forward to helping you. If you have any uh, needs or if you wanna just brainstorm, feel free to call any of us and we're happy to talk. And with that, I'm gonna close it out and we'll look forward to getting together again next year. Thanks very much.